recognition of guests, the Honourable Premier. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Welcome back to my colleagues, uh, all those who are joining us at home, uh, and those who have joined us in the public gallery. Welcome. I um, wanted to begin my remarks today with, with just a short update on uh, what has been a very successful Boston Seafood Show for uh, Prince Edward Island harvesters and producers and processors and everybody involved in the seafood industry. Um, uh, wasn't at the show last year, but the year before, uh, post-COVID, there was kind of a kind of a dullness and uh, and uh, a little bit of pessimism in the industry. But this year, that was replaced with a tremendous sense of optimism. Uh, things look really, really uh, good for the lobster industry in particular, but the seafood industry in general. Uh, very, very proud of the PEI uh, uh, delegation who were there, putting our best foot forward. PEI tourism was also in Boston at the same time, uh, and so in many regards. Uh, PEI took over the city of Boston on the weekend, and it was a very good thing for, for Islanders. So uh, thanks to all those who made that uh, happen, and the best of luck uh, to our seafood uh, producers and harvesters this year. I wanted to also say uh, congratulations to uh, three Islanders who were recognized with National Agricultural Awards by the Fruit and Vegetable Growers of Canada. Uh, Brenda Simmons, of course, uh, from uh, your neck of the woods, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, former assistant uh, GM of the Potato Board, was given a Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, Mary Kay Sagne, who was a seed expert uh, in the potato industry, was uh, uh, given an honorary Lifetime Membership in the uh, Food and Vegetable Growers of Canada. And Alvin Keenan, uh, who co-owns Rolla Bay for, uh, Holdings with his brother Ray, was uh, recognized uh, with the Connery Award for Leadership. So. Uh, three individuals I had the great pleasure to work with over the last number of years, in particular around uh, our issues with Potato Ward. Uh, they're champions, uh, they're brilliant, they're wonderful, kind people, and I couldn't think of three people more worthy of recognition than, than Brenda, Mary Kay, and, and Alvin. Also this morning at the Confederation Center of the Arts, I was joined with some of my federal colleagues, and there was a lot of provincial uh, representation there as well as we announced a, a $60 million uh, renovation and rejuvenation package for the Confederation Center of the Arts, which is the, uh, you know, the center of arts and culture in our province and is an anchor uh, of, 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 of telling our stories as Canadians. Uh, and uh, so a project that took a long time to work through the uh, work through the bureaucracies of the federal and provincial government, but I uh, really was happy to join uh, Sean Casey, who worked hard on this project behind the scenes, and Minister Lawrence McCauley, uh, as well as uh, my colleagues on our side of, of, of government, but, but Steve Bellamy and the people at uh, Confederation Center of the Arts who do a wonderful job. Phase one is going to look amazing. Phase two will be just incredible, so good work by them. And just finally, I want to recognize the Tremendous recent success of Allie Walker from Summerside, a uh, country singer who signed a record deal in Nashville just last week, uh, opened up at a concert in Texas for country star Luke Bryan, uh, has a new song that's already had several thousands of downloads on uh, YouTube and Spotify called I Like Big Trucks. Uh, if you haven't heard it yet, it's a very catchy song. I have no doubt it's going to be a big hit. Uh, when we were in New York City earlier, or just at the end of last year, we had a PEI kitchen party for businesses and tourism operators, uh, and we had ha Allie was at the event uh, playing music. Uh, she stole the show. She blew the doors off the event, uh, and we knew right then that uh, she was going to be something special. So uh, to uh, the daughter of St. Clair and Jean from Summerside, St. Clair, of course, is the police chief in Summerside, to Allie Walker, not that she needs any extra help from here, download her music, check her out. She's the next big thing in country music, and she's from Summerside. So thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today and welcome all those who are watching online and those who are visiting in our gallery. Um, it's quite a difference in, in the weather here in Prince Edward Island. We may be a small province, but this difference in weather. Yesterday morning when I left Tignish around 6.30, there was uh, quite a bit of snow on the ground. It was freezing rain. I, the roads were really, really icy up until I got to about O'Leary. And then it was okay, and even last night going home, it seemed to be okay here in Charlottetown, but once I got back up west again, I hit the snow, and, this, and it never stops. It's, it's been snowing and raining up west since uh, 3 o'clock yesterday, yesterday morning, so it's quite a change in, in the weather, like I said, on the roads, and uh, I do want to send out, a, uh, again, my appreciation and thank you to all those who uh, work 
uh, keeping our roads and highways uh, clean and safe for all islanders because they, they do a great job. Um, while I'm on my feet, Madam Speaker, I'm just going to mention a fundraiser in Tignish, and it's, it's quite a, a common fundraiser or across Prince Edward Island. I know there's one in North Rustico right now, but it's Chase the Ace, and Chase the Ace in Tignish right now is down to two cards. Uh, they'll be uh, doing the draw on this Friday evening at the Tignish Legion. Anticipated to be a little over three hundred thousand dollars, with the fifty-fifty take probably over uh, twenty some thousand dollars in the low twenties. Um, and that's with two cards left. So I just want to take this opportunity to thank the Legion uh, for putting on this uh, draw. And also, just to mention, all when anyone buys a ticket to this particular Chase the Ace, the Legion uh, puts out uh, many supports to the community, such as uh, they made, just made a $150,000 donation to the new long-term care wing at the uh, Seniors uh, Co-op in, in Tignish. Um, as well as donations to the Girl Guide, the 641 Air Cadets, the Fisherman's Haven Park, Santa's for Seniors, West Prince Karen Cupboard, and of course the Tignish uh, Health Centre, and many, many more. And also the Tignish Fire Department is able to purchase new equipment and make necessary uh, upgrades just because of this one particular draw that the Tignish Legion does. So I want to say thank you to the Legion, all the members of the Legion and of the Fire Department who work uh, every week to make this happen and to put money back in the community. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and welcome back to all of my colleagues today. Um, this morning, uh, when I was at the pool, I had the pleasure of meeting a lovely woman. She came up to me. Her name is Rena Thompson, and she encouraged me to continue holding government to account, especially the Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, oh. Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. I'm just kidding. She didn't really, but she was lovely. She came up and introduced herself to me. Um, so today is uh, Dr. Ed McD Yeah, sorry, it's, it's uh, his mom. Yeah. <laughs> uh, today is uh, Dr. Ed McDonald uh, is retiring. He's a, an award-winning professor of history at UPEI um, and of island history in general. And he'll give his last lecture to University 100 students today at 4.30 in room 117 in the main building at UPEI. And this lecture is open to the public. And when I read a little bit longer and saw the University 100 program has been running for approximately the last 15 years in that dates me a bit because I think University 100 came in the first year that I started university. I was a little bit late starting. Um, so he will be giving his the lecture that he always gives to <coughs> University 100 students on the, um, the origins and the missions of, of UPEI and higher education in general in the province. So uh, I wish I was going to be able to make it there, but it does start at 4.30. And refreshments will be served in the faculty lounge of the SDU main building after, afterwards in room uh, 201. And uh, I believe it was mentioned in here before, but it was on the, the, the front page of the Saltwire uh, newspaper today, uh, the guardian of Cameron, Cameron Gordon of Stratford taking the, the main stage uh, for the fourth season of Canada's Got Talent. And his longtime, more than 10-year dance instructor, Megan Connors, uh, joined him for auditions and will be joining him on stage. The auditions happened in November. And I first had the pleasure of meeting Cameron at 2021 Dancing with the Stars fundraiser where him and Megan won uh, the contest. I, I still can't believe they won over the honorable member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Um, but Cameron is one of those people when you meet him the first time, you never forget him. He just has such an infectious smile and personality. He's so warm and so funny. Um, and so he adds this to a, a very impressive list of accomplishments. He's won gold medals in Special Olympics. He's taken part in various island dance uh, contests, competitions. And uh, he's also had done a lot of modeling. So um, he just, they really appreciate the support of Islanders both um, in spirit and, and financially. And they're hoping that uh, there's many Islanders who host watch parties on March 26th when it airs on City TV. And they encourage everyone to tag Gordon's social media account at Team Gordon. So I look forward to that and I look forward to the day's proceedings. Have a great day. Thank you. Speaker. Good morning to anyone in beautiful District 1 that might be watching today. I just wanted to rise today as a proud dad and brag a little bit about my daughter, Leslie Croucher. On Monday, Leslie received her offer of employment as a primary care paramedic with Island EMS. Now, Madam Speaker, as an MLA, I might not have any immediate fixes to the shortage of highly trained health professionals, 
but as a dad, I am certainly doing my part. Leslie now joins her sister Jenna, tasked with the important work of attending to the health care needs of all islanders. I couldn't be any prouder of both of my girls, but today I want to congratulate Leslie for her accomplishments over the last couple of years. I am confident that the patients in your care will receive only the best from you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Good, good afternoon, Madam Speaker, and welcome to my colleagues and those in the gallery, and especially those watching from District 11. Um, I want to rise today to wish Wayne Garens a happy belated birthday. Madam Speaker, Wayne's family managed to pull off a surprise 70 birthday, 70th birthday party for him last weekend, and I think they were very excited about the fact that they could have that they pulled this off. So um, I hope that he had a wonderful time, and he, cheers to another year. Happy birthday, Wayne. The Minister of uh, Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's a pleasure to rise today to uh, bring greetings to everybody who's watching these proceedings, uh, in particular the ones that I've visited last night at the uh, Community Care Facility uh, Le Chinou in Wallington. Uh, and I'd like to mention them because I told them I would bring their names forward and I told them when we hear your name, please stand in your room. And they said they would. So I said, uh, so there's Irene Arsenault, Albert and Norma Arsenault, and also a special shout out to my Aunt Lorraine Brown, who's not at that community facility, but uh, is living up in Abrams Village and he, she's uh, watching religi uh, religiously. I also want to share with you today and send my, I guess, my condolences to the, fam the family of Pierre Arsenault, who has been a very active member of our Acadian Francophone community. Uh, Pierre Arsenault was uh, known to many uh, of us here in Prince Edward Island as a, a priest, a Catholic priest in, uh, in the, our parish for 20 years, then pursued a different career and uh, started uh, studying law, became a law professor at the University of Moncton very active with the uh, Société saint thomas d'Aquin and also with the uh, Vaucadien paper and he passed uh, a couple of days ago and I'd like to bring my con send my condolences to his wife Lucille and to his family Alora. and he always encouraged me because he taught me actually in university at University of Moncton uh, common law in French and he always said don't be afraid to, to show your colors and speak French so I will uh, send a few messages to him and his family uh, in saying in French Mes sympathies à la famille de Pierre de Feu, Pierre Arsenault. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to welcome back all my colleagues here today, as well as our gallery guests and all those that may be tuning in from District 5 on this lovely day. Uh, I wanted to stand, Madam Speaker, today to congratulate our Stratford Youth Group, who had a very successful fundraiser this past weekend. And in the form of teams, they walked over 700 kilometers in a 24-hour period, raising over $5,000 through donations, all the money going back to initiatives that they like to do within the community. So congratulations to those. Uh, uh, great, great youth. Also, I wanted to bring a quick congratulations to all of our uh, PIO teams that were across playing in the River UDF tournament. We brought back many medals, which is uh, amazing for, for PEI. It's such a great, uh, great event. And I want to say special congrats to Charlottetown Team Morley on uh, receiving the silver. Thank you. Member from Summerside, Boulders. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'd like to start off by welcoming all my colleagues back today and the members in the gallery and Everybody watching from District 21, the greatest district out there, especially my faithful watchers, uh, Joan, Kathy, Elizabeth, and Carrie. She's at work and tells me she watches every day. Uh, I'd like to start off by saying yesterday before I came down to the legislature, I had the pleasure of being in attendance for the City of Summerside's budget speech. And uh, once again, the city delivered a great budget and were able to balance their budget once again. So kudos to the City of Summerside. Secondly, I'd like to uh, let everybody know in the district and right across the whole island that if you're looking for a fun family activity this weekend, that's free. Hockey PEI is hosting their provincials for a lot of the leagues right across the island from Tignish to Surrey. Uh, I know I'll be in Tignish where the Honourable Leader of the Opposition will be there selling 50-50 informs me. I was trying to get a dinner out of him, but he tells me he'll be there selling 50-50, so instead of getting a dinner, I'll be spending money. But uh, also in Summerside, they'll be hosting the U15A Boys Tournament. So if you're looking for something to do, it's a great activity to bring the whole family and get to see some great hockey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I just want to rise, say hello to everybody watching from District 14, Charlottetown West Royalty. Hope you have a great day today. And just salute all the um, all the basketball players from all over Prince Edward Island who's been participating in the basketball championship. This is such a great event for for. Uh, boys and girls to, to participate. It's it's very well done. So congratulations to all the, the players who participated and Holland College for hosting. Um, just want to say hello to a member in the gallery. Uh, Kartik Goyal is here. And um, thanks for joining us here. He works at Vanco Farms and is a, a great contributor to Prince Edward Island. So it's a great pleasure to talk about some of the issues that are facing you beforehand. And uh, welcome to the proceedings. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just wanted to rise and welcome everyone here to the chamber and, of course, everyone watching from District 18, Rustico Emerald. Uh, I wanted to make sure that all the members in the House knew that uh, there is a public consultation tonight in Hunter River at the Lions Club, 7 p.m., for the Service Dog Act. Now, members may know I haven't actually tabled the consultation draft here. It was A previous version was tabled by Jamie Fox, but definitely stop out. I've gotten some good feedback so far, and I think it's going to be a really good discussion. I expect probably 20 to 30 people there. Um, and I want to make sure that we have a consultation in case I need to amend the act before I table it and bring it to the floor. I think it's an important piece of legislation, and I, I look forward to, uh, you know, debating it on the floor, but perhaps seeing some of you here uh, tonight at the public consultation. The member from Charlottetown, Winslow, and the government whip. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I rise actually to uh, recognize the birthday of one of your constituents. Uh, my father, John Bell, down in uh, Guernsey Cove, is 74 years young today. Um, I was thinking about that. I can't believe it because I always picture my father about my age, about 40, when I was growing up. And uh, anyway, I do think that over at dialysis, he's at dialysis right now, and I do think that they do watch the legislature from time to time. So. <laughs> If you are watching this, Dad, uh, one of the comments that I ran into a, a gentleman from Surrey down to uh, McPhee, and uh, he was asking me how your father is, and, and I told him about you know his uh, time on dialysis, and he's like, one thing about your father, he's uh, he's stronger than or he's uh, tougher than a boiled owl, and I hadn't heard that phrase in a long time, and I thought it was you know what very fitting for my father. So anyway, happy birthday, Dad. I love you, and uh, hopefully you have a great day. Statements by members, beginning with the member from Kensington, Malpeck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It is a pleasure to rise today to recognize Kathy Kaisley. Kaisley's have been in the wedding and event industry for 40 years. Kathy opened the doors to Kaisley's Bridal Boutique in 1985, which sells prom gowns, wedding gowns, and other accessories. Her mission is to provide quality products at affordable prices while offering her customers the best possible experience when searching for the perfect outfit for a special occasion. Throughout the years, the company involved from a full service wedding shop to include rental pro products such as marquee tents, furniture, and other special event pieces. They've helped numerous individuals and groups alike carry out very successful events, ranging from weddings to corporate functions to concerts. Being a local small business owner in Kensington gave Kathy the opportunity to employ fellow Islanders of all ages. Over the years, Islanders have been very fortunate to have benefited from Kathy's experience, wealth, of the, wealth and knowledge, and passion for the event industry. Demonstrating dedication and hard work, Kathy has spent an incredible amount of time outside of regular business hours to run a successful business, all while raising a family. For over 40 years, Kathy has been an amazing leader in the bridal and special occasion gown industry on the island. She absolutely loved her career, and there wasn't a day that she was not excited to go to work. Congratulations to Kathy on this milestone achievement and a very well-deserved retirement. All the best, my friend. Member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Known as the region's leader in law enforcement training, the Atlantic Police Academy first opened in 1971 and has since trained thousands of public safety officers serving in communities all across Canada. Located in Slemon Park, Summerside, the Atlantic Police Academy offers courses for police, fire, corrections, indigenous fish guardians, community safety officers, sheriffs, and conservation officers. There is a significant demand for police and public safety officers across the country in Atlantic Canada and here in PEI, and they are working diligently to find ways to increase our capacity to meet these demands. The programs and training are delivered by excellent staff 
who have collaborated with the public safety agencies to develop and implement the most up-to-date training to exceed the industry standards. The Slemon Park facilities include an interactive crime scene village and residential replica, interactive high-risk simulation training center, 10,000-foot concrete runway for driver training, specialized lab for the investigation of alcohol-related offenses, firearms simulation, and fully equipped fitness center. Over the last number of years, the Police Academy has worked to increase its capacity from 125 to a full complement of 250 cadets. The Atlantic Police Academy also continues to expand in its service training opportunities as well. So I want to congratulate the Atlantic Police Academy on its continued growth and for the important role it plays as a post-secondary institution training individuals for career, future careers in the law enforcement. Thank you, Madam Speaker. A member from Charlottetown West Royalty. I rise today to address a pressing concern affecting Prince Edward Island, the culture of alcohol safe usage. It's disheartening to note the prevalent issue of impairment due to alcohol, cannabis, and other substances in our communities. We often hear about Islanders being charged with impaired driving by both the RCMP, local police forces, to the extent that it's becoming normalized. Our current resources primarily lies with the confines of the criminal justice system, resulting and punitive measures such as fines, short-term incarcerations, and license suspensions. <coughs> However, while punishments may address individual offenses, it fails to offer a substantial solution. We witness repeated charges against the same individuals, indicating a system failure in our approach. What's lacking is a proactive preventative strategy. From a health and social standpoint, alcohol alone contributes to 6,000 emergency department visits, over 700 hospitalizations, and 135 deaths in 2020, costing our island $280 million. A former PEI RCMP superintendent emphasized the cultural roots of drinking and driving during the standing committee session in 2020. I tr strongly support and encourage a harm reduction approach, emphasizing the mantra, less is best. Our province needs initiatives that permeate our educational institutions, drinking establishments, and social settings. It's imperative our island embrace a cultural shift, transcending beyond social media platforms with minimal impact towards tangible actions that promote responsible consumption and prioritize the well-being of islanders. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions by members, beginning with uh, responses to questions taken as notice. The Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, Madam Speaker, yesterday the Leader of the Official Opposition asked a question about total nursing vacancies, which I took on notice. Madam Speaker, as of February 29th, Health PEI has approximately 312 vacancies. More specifically, 223 registered nurse vacancies and 89 licensed practical nurse vacancies. This includes permanent and temporary vacancies due to leave, but excludes positions that are truly temporary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So yesterday I received information from Health PEI as a result of a freedom of information request that was related to the number of practicing family physicians and the number of islanders registered with each physician. And I'll table that later today. So according to this, this, this disclosure, there are roughly 131,000 islanders <coughs> with access to a physician. Will the minister please tell the House how many islanders are currently on the patient registry? The Honourable <coughs> Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, I have not looked at the website uh, lately, but it is uh, absolutely north of, of 36,000. It, it presents a challenge to our health care system. Uh, we've all recognized that we've had more than 25,000 people uh, move here in the last five years. That does place additional challenges on placing people with physicians, uh, but we'll continue to try uh, to make uh, improvements in recruitment, scope of practice, and access for Islanders. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So as most people know, there are, are close to 37, it's closing in on 37,000 people right now in Prince Edward Island on the patient registry. That's 37,000 Islanders who don't have access to the most basic health care services, something that every Islander or every Canadian should expect. Will the Minister please tell the House what the current population of Prince Edward Island is? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm not sure. Again, I do I do know uh, from my time in finance that we do up to update those numbers on a quarterly basis. So I'm going to make a guesstimate that it's north of 175,000 at this time. Um, again, it continues to to increase. I think last year was 6,700 uh, New Islanders that uh, chose PEI as a as a home, which is about the size of the community that I represent in Cornwall. So again. Um, uh, the secret's out about how good PEI is uh, for a place to live, and uh, we continue to welcome those people who want to live here. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, so, yes, he is correct. The latest population estimates estimate uh, that oh, there's over 175,000 people here on Prince Edward Island. And those are people who call our island home, and they don't have access to the most basic health care services, which is access to a family doctor. So based on, on those facts, the actual number of islanders without a family doctor is not 37,000, it's actually 44,000 and could grow as high as 50,000 as we welcome new islanders um, every day to Prince Edward Island and as doctor's offices continue to close. So from my read of these numbers, our situation is much worse than government has acknowledged. So will the Minister please tell the House, why does this government not report this additional 7,000 people in the public reports to Islanders? Mm. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And again, we do understand the importance of, of giving people access to care. Um, again, we do have other options within our system, uh, such as Pharmacy Plus and our virtual care uh, platform as well, which we are going to RFP very soon to expand that service to Islanders. So I think that's very a positive move to allow people to access uh, a physician virtually. So again, we keep working on avenues to access uh, care on PEI. Um, we. There are uh, some walk-in clinics, again, and, and if people want to see that list, I uh, just suggest to PEI government find health care, and, and there's a list of all our services on one page. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Speaker. Well, we continue to hear from the Premier over and over again, no matter what question we ask, whether these are the pre-written statements uh, that he just keeps regurgitating over and over and not answering the questions. So, uh, Madam Speaker, another problem revealed by these numbers is the slow process of, of introducing collaborative health records. This has been a massively expensive project and it does not appear to be overly effective. Will the Minister please tell the House how many Islanders are covered by physicians participating in the collaborative health <coughs> records? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, I'm assuming he's uh, referencing the EMR program, I think, that we have on Prince Edward Island. So again, we have exceeded expectations. I believe we have about 90% of our family physicians who adopted. Interesting to note, uh, Kai High released some numbers the other day that actually 93% of all family physicians in Canada have access to electronic medical records. So, um, and there has been discussions. I think we have an advantage with our size in choosing one vendor. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in Ontario that they have three, at least three vendors. And it's causing a lot of issues, and they're going to have to spend a lot of money in order to select one vendor and merge those three systems together. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. But according to these documents, only about a third of Ireland patients who um, actually have a family doctor are covered by these collaborative health records. So about 45,000 out of 131,000 total who have access to a family physician. So, Minister, what is the problem with this project? Why is it so expensive and why does it appear, appear to be so ineffective? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, M Madam Speaker. Again, our movement to electronic medical records is very strong. Um, it's the way physicians want to uh, provide care, and I guess it gives us the opportunity for other providers to provide care uh, with access to records. Um, I remember the days when my mother was diagnosed with ALS that I had to go down to the polyclinic and, and take the file um, with me to Halifax uh, when uh, I took her to see a specialist. So those days are no longer here. Um, they allow us to um, have other providers provide care. Um, I, I believe we have over 1,000 of our current providers using the system and again if you haven't accessed the system I don't imagine we'd have a record on, or, on you yet but once you enter um, uh, have care um, you will be recorded on our EMR system. Thank you. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much Madam Speaker. Well, this, this minister again was just patting himself on the back saying how many people were, were actually registered on there uh, with their records but our FOIP request from Health PEI says something totally different. So. Oh. You, you're going to have to get up to, up to speed on this file, uh, Minister. 
Again, according to the FOIP, the province is now relying on estimates to determine how many islanders are actually registered with a primary care physician. Mm. And it's amazing, Madam Speaker. Here we have the most vital of services provided to islanders, and it appears that a great deal of this information is based on guesswork. Why is the minister, or why is this government, relying on estimates? Where there is work, to, where is the work to determine the actual number of islanders who actually need a family physician? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, I guess I'll go back a little bit to give some specific stats with regards to our EMR program. Um, as of March 12th, we had 260 providers using our system in 95 clinics, with approximately 1,000 users in total. So this uh, surpasses our goal of 167 um, <clears throat> Uh, practicing physicians to, to use that system. Again, uh, I don't think we're in a paper-based world anymore, so again, um, these, these EMR um, uh, systems are important to provide really good care. We've done some surveying with our physicians, and 75% of the respondents are reporting that they're coordinating patient care better with the use of our current EMR. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I will leader of the opposition. Well, Madam Speaker, I think you should go have a conversation with Health PEI because your numbers do not match up with theirs. So, Madam Speaker, to repeat, um, the number of islanders um, now looks like those without a family physician is about 44,000. So that is well over the population of Montague, Stratford, Summerside, O'Leary, and Cornwall all together combined. Madam Speaker, this is a massive failure. The Premier has promised everyone would be off the patient registry by the end of this year. So my question, does the Minister support the Premier's promise and believe that this shortfall of services will be addressed by the end of the year? The yeah, well, Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. And again, uh, it's access to the most responsible uh, medical provider, I think, is our goal. Again, the, we value the... the the skill uh, sets of our nurse practitioners within our system. Um, again, we continue to add scope of practice so that we can serve Islanders. There is no doubt that the population growth has placed pressures on this when uh, a province has the highest growth rate in all of Canada that places significant pressures on health care and our ability to deliver it. But again, we're going to continue to march forward and trying to fill these gaps for Islanders. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. So again, continued from yesterday, continued from every day this session, continuation from every question last fall. The Minister does not answer the questions that we're asking this House. And we're not asking these questions on behalf of ourselves. We're asking these questions on behalf of Islanders because they're very concerned about the health care situation here in Prince Edward Island. So, Madam Speaker, I want to quote from the letter from Health PEI. At this time, it's difficult to accurately track the number of individual patients registered to a physician. So, Madam Speaker, this is a remarkable confession. This government can't even manage to accurately report the number of Islanders who have actual um, access to a family physician. You can't even get that much right, Madam Speaker. They can't. So how on earth can Islanders have confidence in this government's plan to initiate and to help run a complicated, expensive project like a medical school? Again, don't you think you should get the basics first? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Madam Speaker. I'm not sure what type of question was in there in that uh, in that question from the Honourable Member, but I will try to... To, to address some of his concerns, again, yes, we are investing in a medical school. Yes, we are investing in, in, in increasing nursing seats. Yes, we're increasing in uh, scope of practice. Yes, we're increasing on uh, incentive programs to attract respiratory therapists and allied health professionals. Yes, we are, uh, gosh, I keep going, but Pharmacy Plus, we will continue to invest to try to give access to Islanders. That's what we do every single day. And again, I want to shout out to our, the staff in our department and everybody at Health PEI who are doing this. Uh, as hard as they can and as fast as they can. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Question to the Minister of Health. This year, the province invested close to $9 million in travel nurses. Did the province use the services of Canadian Health Labs to find those travel nurses? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, we did not contract uh, CHL to provide uh, agency nurses to Prince Edward Island. Uh, back to some questions yesterday. Yes, we have invested about six, six point eight million dollars in travel nurses. The total nursing budget on PEI uh, coming up this year will be north of one hundred and thirty million dollars, which again is probably uh, some napkin math, about three percent of our budget. We want to move it to one percent or zero. That's our goal, and we're going to try to do that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
Will the minister please bring back to the House tomorrow a list of for-profit nursing agencies used by this government to recruit travel nurses? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I can't see why not. We did have an expression of interest in our RFP process to select vendors. So again, I think that's public information. So we can certainly bring, uh, I believe it's four providers back to the House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Charles and West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Access to care at our emergency rooms is becoming a dire waiting game. And let's be clear, it's not a game. Islanders who require hospital administrations are languishing in the ERs due to lack of available beds. As of this morning, 28 Islanders are still awaiting placement at the QEH. Madam Speaker, this is undeniable a problem, and this is about outflow, a bed block. What concern, what concrete steps, Minister, are you taking to collaborate with Health PLEI to address this persisting challenge? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Again, I'll draw reference to our meeting with the PEI uh, Nursing Association where they indicated that they have capacity to take on another uh, plus 50 beds. Um, we do have the staff now. It was a challenge probably a year ago is that we couldn't, we didn't have enough staff to keep these beds open. We're now in the mid 90% range uh, for bed openings for 95% of our facilities. So we're now in the position due to a program like the RCW, for example, to support um, the, the, the expansion of our uh, LTC program, which should have some very positive impacts at the QEH. Good news. Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Madam Speaker, the Premier said during a State of the Province address about the potential of adding 54 beds by private long-term care owners within 30 days. The clock is ticking. The Premier will soon be at as 30-day commitment. Minister of Health, can you provide a definite timeline for when these beds will be available? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I'm glad you actually asked this question because it's very important uh, to to define this this um, finish line for us. There is an approval process and a licensing board that we deal with. So the actual correct way uh, to, to phrase this is 30 days from approval. We need to make sure that we have approval on these beds from this licensing board, that they're safe and that they're the same the specs that we expect from our LTC. So it's 30 days from appro approval. We'll continue to work on getting these beds open as fast as possible. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm member from Charlottetown West Royalty. And that wasn't really talked about uh, in the state of the provincial address. Uh, it was... We didn't think it'd show up. We didn't they, think they show broadcast up. this all Prince Edward Island. Yeah. Madam Speaker, the Premier indicated these beds will be accessible within 30 days, and now we hear it's about licensing, and we know that on this side of the House. So the question is, when will this license process be completed? Because you said, and this government said, 30 days, uh, not too long ago. The Honourable Premier. Madam Speaker, opposition, when I actually came to the event, they would have heard exactly what I said, which is exactly what the Minister just said, is that 30 days after licensing we can get this going. We've gone back to the, uh, to the PEI Nursing uh, Homes Association. We've asked them to do everything they can to go do this as fast as possible. There's a regulatory uh, 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 understanding that needs to take place, but that is being worked on. It'll be, uh, they'll be open, 54 beds, as soon as they can be humanly open. We've stepped up, we've worked with everyone, and if the opposition would actually came to the event, they might have heard some of the good news that they're railing against here time and time again, Madam Speaker. I suggest you worry more about what you're saying to Islanders and how that's a misleading statement. You said 30 days. When are these beds going to be opened up, Mr. Premier? Whoa, whoa, whoa. You can't do somebody lying here. You also can't be talking out. Honorable Member. <clears throat> I'd like you to withdraw that statement, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I withdraw the statement. <clears throat> and is there a question? When will the beds be open that the Premier talked about? And now there's some serious, there's some serious confusion on this side of the legislature. When is this process going to be done? When are we going to have these 54 beds open for Prince Edward Islanders? Honorable Premier. Well, Madam Speaker, it comes as no shock to me that there's a massive confusion over the other side of the House, because I've been witness to it every day in here. 
Uh, what we have done is we've taken the unprecedented step to sit down with the association to say, what do you have within your capacity? How quickly can we work together to make this happen? How much money will it cost? We will step up and do it. It will take some of the pressure off of our emergency rooms and the bed flow in the hospitals. I would take great offense to the opposition suggesting somebody in the bed is a bed blocker. They're an islander who needs a home and we're working hard to get them a home, uh, Madam Speaker. They deserve a place too. By doing this, by having 54 beds open as soon as humanly possible, uh, we will make space within our hospitals to improve the bed flow. And beyond that, we've asked the association to say, how quickly can you rally to build hundreds more? We're going to loan them low interest money to do so, so we can finally invest uh, what other governments failed to do in the past, is invest in our seniors, invest in our islanders, and to make the most efficient health care system we can in this province. Question to the Premier, are you invested in public long-term care beds at the same time as you're investing in private ones? We have a hybrid system in this province. We've made great investments. We'll continue. I'm having a meeting with the uh, member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke, after this uh, uh, question period to talk about expansion in places like Tyne Valley for our public homes. So absolutely. But let's stop pitting one against the other in here like the opposition is doing. It's a sad, sad day when we do that in this province. Well, and, and you know what? In, in our province, it costs more for public long-term care beds, and they're sacred in our province. Uh, we need to invest in both. But you just said, I don't know what you just said there, are we investing in our public long-term care facilities at the same time looking for more beds? We need more beds across the board, not just private, in all aspects of Prince Edward in long-term care. Honorable Premier. <clears throat> Madam Speaker, yes. Honorable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Well, I mean, well, we'll see when that is because there was no 30-day announcement on the, the public long-term care beds, and they're in, they're in, they're in dire need of, of, of some additions. Um, the talking about standards, Madam Speaker, the long-term care review highlighted discrepancies in care standards between public and private facilities, recommending that the implementation of the national standards across all, all long-term care facilities. Will private long-term care facilities be compelled to adopt these standards? And when? Question to the Premier or question to the Minister of Health? I don't know who's answering anymore. Minister of Health and well, Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd love to answer the question. Obviously, the long-term care review is a very a uh, valuable piece of work uh, for us uh, that uh, will outline uh, our strategy going forward. Uh, we are going to follow every single recommendation. There are 17 in that report. It's a great roadmap for us to ensure that we have patient-centered care at any facility on PEI and that the standards are maintained. And we are very excited about the wage parity program that we're going to introduce um, so we can uh, ensure that uh, compensation is the same at both facilities, and we're going to continue to work on all of those other 16 um, recommendations in that report. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Charlton West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And this is uh, these are important questions, Madam Speaker. The long-term care review advised establishing a single legislative act governing all long-term care homes, ensuring consistency, consistent care standards regardless of ownership. Question to the minister: Will you commit right now to introducing such comprehensive legislation in this house? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I think he used a key word uh, in, in his question, the comprehensive. Obviously, comprehensive legislation takes time. Um, it needs to be thorough and really well thought out. So again, um, it would be not uh, prudent for me to uh, set a date on how we can uh, restructure that act. But again, the long-term re review is very clear in setting out uh, goals and expectations for patient-centered care and our long-term care facilities. So we will, it is a checklist. Our department is working on it every day and we'll continue to work on it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm the leader of the third party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I met with the Department of Health and Wellness <coughs> last month and it's one of those meetings that I haven't been able to get out of my mind. During that meeting, we were told directly and confidently that public mental health services and PEI are fully equipped to meet the needs of Islanders without lengthy wait times. Question to the Minister, do you still stand by that statement? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I just want to clarify the question. We were talking about a particular service at that time, um, again, uh, which we have um, responded to some of the concerns from the member and the public. We continue to work on that particular situation. So again, our mental health um, 
facilities um, have some seasonality to it. There's no doubt that at certain times of the year. But again, uh, we've made significant strides over the last four or five years. And uh, my understanding is that actually the, uh, the new uh, campus uh, tender will go out in the next 30 days. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Leader, the third party, your first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And just to clarify, that was a general statement made by your department, not about the specific program. Mm. As the former chair for Health PEI Board said at the Summerside Town Hall meeting last month, while I have no doubt what you are saying is true, from your perspective, what you're being told is not necessarily true. I cannot for the life of me reconcile what the department told me with what I'm hearing from Islanders almost daily. I hear from parents who wait for years to get children diagnosed and treated. I hear from Islanders of all ages who can't get treatments or even worse, get their treatment ripped away from them. Question to the minister. The fact that your department believes that mental health care is fine has led to treatment options being removed from Islanders. For example, those who are receiving treatment at Serene View Ranch. Is the care adequate and Islanders are at fault? Or is the care inadequate and you're cutting much needed therapy options? Thank you, Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I do ex take exception to um, public sector employees not informing uh, their ministers uh, appropriately. I think that's a pretty bold statement to make in any forum. I trust my staff uh, very much. They're very dedicated. I believe every single thing they tell me. Um, I am, as you know, in the House here, I do ask for a lot of data and a lot of facts. Uh, with regards to services, and I do have some numbers with regards to mental health access uh, programs and how many people have accessed them in tw uh, 2023, so I can provide that to the member if she'd like. But back to our conversation, I do get a lot of emails, and I did tell uh, the Honourable Member in this meeting that I do get a lot of emails about access and so on and so forth, and I do, the, if she has uh, issues with mental health access, please pass them along. I'll pass along my staff and see how we can improve them. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Leader, the third party. I take offence to that statement almost. The mental health care in this province is atrocious. Mm -hmm. I choose to believe Islanders and the health care professionals who tell me that wait times for mental health diagnosis and therapy are far too long and access is limited. A mental health ER is great, but Islanders also need access to regular therapy to keep them out of the ER. I know many Islanders who have chosen to pay out of pocket to get much needed services they or their children need because of the wait times in the public system. Question to the Minister of Health. Again, if our public mental health care system is adequate, why are island families choosing to pay out of pocket to get services? And why won't you bring more mental health care professionals into our public system to provide the care we need in a more timely manner? Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And to the last part of that question, we would welcome anybody that's in the private sector that would like to work in the, in the, in the public sector for sure. We continue to have opportunities in mental health, so we will absolutely entertain that. We, don't, uh, we would welcome anybody to move from, from private to public uh, from that perspective. So again, um, we understand um, there is mental health challenges. It's an increasing in our society these days. Um, we have made great strides, and again, uh, we'll continue to do so. Um, you know, just some crazy numbers in front of me that we've had over 1,500 people attend our mental health walk-in clinics in 2023. So there are people accessing our services. Um, our Mental Health and Addictions na Navigator, again, a recommendation to anybody who is having uh, issues with cha uh, challenges accessing our system, had more than three, uh, 380 calls in the last 10 months. So that uh, indicates that people are reaching out, and hopefully we are giving them the pathways to, to get help. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. Wayne Gretzky famously told us that you need to skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it's been. He explained his success as being largely due to this ability to anticipate and to act accordingly. I figure that successful governing is kind of like that too. Anticipating what's coming and proactively acting with that knowledge is a far more efficient and effective way to manage than reacting after things have happened. A question to the Premier. We all know how much you love hockey, but when it comes to governing, you're clearly no Gretzky. The housing crisis that we have today was entirely predictable. Why did it take you and your government five years to release a strategy to even begin to address this crisis? Honourable <coughs> Premier. Well, Madam Speaker, uh, the proactive knowledge to anticipate what we need to do and to make the investments would be something like the medical school 
I would say, which we are seeing from the third party here, that they don't want us to do that. They kind of want us to do that, but they really don't want us to do that because they're scared there might be something positive in this for Islanders. Uh, we just released the most comprehensive uh, housing strategy, perhaps in the country. It's very, very aggressive. Uh, it's, it's certainly decades old, the challenges that we were facing, uh, and we continue to make record investments in this area. Uh, we have built as fast as we could build. Uh, we need more people, and we're working on that with the Construction Association uh, to build even more. Uh, we are working at breakneck speed to ta tackle a problem that's 15 or 20 years old that other governments failed to tackle in serious uh, uh, abilities like we have. Uh, and I'm very proud of our minister, how hard he has been working on it, and the comprehensive strategy that he's put forward should serve Islanders well into the future, Madam Speaker. Here, here. Madam Speaker, I find it ironic that the best housing strategy in the country that was released just two weeks ago, part of the first section is titled The Importance of Taking Action. And given that it was abundantly clear five years ago that PEI's housing crisis was already here, perhaps a more appropriate title for this section would have been The Consequences of Not Taking Action. <coughs> If we'd skated to where the puck was going to be five years ago, with the knowledge that the Premier just said, it's been decades old, the severity of the housing crisis on PEI could have largely been avoided. Yesterday, in budget debate, we found out that several of this government's flagship programmes, the Rent to Own, the Tiny Homes programme, the Municipal Infrastructure programme, either have not been launched yet, or have barely got going and there's no spending in any of the spending lines. To the Premier, it took you five years to start tackling this issue. Why, as well as being super late to this game, are you not even spending the money that was approved in this legislature in last year's budget? Well, it sounds to me like the former leader of the third party is ragging the puck, uh, Madam Speaker, to use the hockey analogy, and uh, really talking around a bunch of things that aren't exactly accurate. Uh, we have built more housing starts in this province in the last five years than any time in our history. As a matter of fact, if you talk to the Construction Association, they would say, we couldn't have built any more. You can't pick up a rock in Prince Edward Island and throw it without hitting a new development in Prince Edward Island. We are working as hard as we possibly can. We have a comprehensive strategy. And for this member to sit there and suggest that nothing has been done in five years, I think he might be looking in the mirror a little too much. Right. Right. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, five years ago, the Green Caucus released a housing strategy. And you know what's the most frustrating thing from those of us on this side of the House who were pleading for action half a decade ago? It's that the issues we described in that housing strategy, population pressures, a lack of public housing, a need for regulatory updates, all of these were present back then. And because of your government's uselessness, nothing has gotten done. To the Premier, if I was to exchange the front page off our five-year-old report with the one of yours that was released just a few weeks ago, you could barely tell them apart. Why should Islanders have confidence that your idle government will suddenly start to fix a problem that you've only sat back and let get worse for the last five years? Well, it's hard to make sense of it, Madam Speaker. Um, I suppose it's easy to sit back but never having the ability to do anything or suspect anything to get done and just cast dispersions as to why things aren't getting done. I guess that must be a comfortable seat to be in. Uh, what we have to deal with are the realities. As I say, the most starts ever in our history over the last five years, building at a speed that's almost unsustainable for those who are working within it. Look around Prince Edward Island, take a drive outside of Charlottetown, take a drive inside of Charlottetown and see see the housing starts. They're record after record after record. We know it's not enough, but we keep on going. We keep on rolling because that's what we have to do. We have a comprehensive strategy, one of the best in the country that we're going to continue to follow, and we're going to work with industry and work with islanders to address this problem, and I hope the uh, third party can be counted on to do that, but I don't know. We've seen in here, Madam Speaker, that uh, uh, that ship has sailed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Health Care Futures Program has been around for many years, providing island high school and post-secondary students summer employment opportunities in the health sector. So the question to the Minister of Health, 
How many students participated in this program each year? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker, uh, and I appreciate the question on the Healthcare Futures Program. It's a great way to talk about it. Actually, I'm pretty sure that the applications are opening this week. Uh, don't quote me on that. I think it's coming very soon. I know it's been March um, about this program. So for anybody who's not familiar with it, it's where we um, take people that are in high school or a university and in healthcare training and get the op they get the opportunity to work in our long-term care facilities and community care facilities alongside health professionals. Um, I do have uh, some relatives that, uh, that may have uh, participated in this program in the past. So it is a great program. I believe it's about 40 to 45 on a normal year would participate in this program. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Time Valley Sherbrooke, your first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. One of the advantages of programs like this is that it can provide an exposure to the health care system and perhaps encourage further pursuit of a health career. So question to the Minister of Health. How do we promote this program to high school and post-secondary students? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you. I guess, uh, you know, the quick answer is we try to reach those, uh, those students where they are. So obviously social media is a big part uh, of reaching out to that demographic. But my understanding is that we do get actually about 200 or 250 applications uh, each year. So the awareness of the program is very strong. Um, we'd like to have more placements. But uh, that would be, again, I would, I would pretty confident that uh, people in the healthcare field are considering it, uh, know about the program. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Member from Shine Valley Sherbrooke, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. A program like Healthcare Futures has value at a time when we're trying to attract people into healthcare careers and help give our hardworking staff more help over the busy summer months. The post secondary component of the Health Futures program uh, currently starts in June and runs about 11 weeks, but post-secondary students are usually done of school before May. Question to the Minister. Would we ever look at extending the Health Care Futures program to start earlier so that more post-secondary students could take advantage and our existing health workers could get some extra support? Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank, thank you, Member, and thank you for the question. It, it does uh, pose a question whether, I think it's 11 and 8 weeks, I think, is, is the two parameters, whether we should extend it. So it is a great question. I think the most important part of this program is that we have the right opportunities uh, for uh, those people to work within our facilities. Um, so we want to support them as best they can. So they, it's a great introduction to our health care system. So duly noted, um, and we'll have to have a look at that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We've heard during presentations at Standing Committee about health recruitment and the different challenges and bottlenecks in the process. Question to the Minister of Finance. How many PSC staff are working on health hiring? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Um, I wouldn't necessarily have exactly the number of staff. I can, I can certainly, that can be something I can bring back right away, uh, the number of staff, but I know we do have dedicated staff to health hiring. I know that in priority positions that we want to ex expedite through, that's done. I know that um, if a priority position comes in, um, the interview or the um, resumes are looked at, that bucket is looked at every day to see um, what resumes sit in there and they're vetted as soon as they come in. They don't wait for the closing date. So there's a lot of things going on there to expedite that process. Thanks. Member from Shelton Belvedere. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Turnaround times are ongoing, a hot topic, and I think most would agree that everyone wants a sure, shorter turnaround time when it comes to filling vacancies. Question to the Minister of Finance. What is the current turnaround time for health postings, and is that turnaround time taking more or less time? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, if we're talking about staffing and classification, what I can tell you is um, our volumes are up, but our turnaround is much faster. And I guess one of the metrics that I could share here is um, um, we are 40% faster than we were in 2019, 2020. So there's been significant improvement um, on turnarounds within the PSE on, um, on all positions, quite frankly, but especially health PI positions. Thank you, Member Madam Speaker. second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and fewer steps, quicker turnaround times when it comes to hiring um, health employees is somewhat we all want to see happening. Um, question to the same minister. How is your department trying to further streamline these steps? 
The Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I think there was a, a document shared um, um, in the media here yesterday. And uh, what uh, my colleague here, Minister of Health and Wellness, and myself have done is we've asked the staff to give us uh, on the ground what is happening, what are the steps today, and we really hope to be able to table that today or tomorrow. Um, the document that was shared was a, kind of a third-party consultant um, that drew it up, and it was over a year, done over a year ago. Um, what we hope to provide the House is a today um, operations flowchart of how that's being handled today. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So my question is to the Minister of Health. Many Islanders I've spoken to were, were quite excited last year. First, there was a political promise by the Premier in the 2023 election to introduce a caregiver grant program. Then it was discussed in last year's budget, and we passed a $5.2 million, million dollar line in spending for that service as a budgetary matter nearly a year ago, Madam Speaker. So will the Minister please tell the House how many Island families have currently been served under the Primary Caregivers Program? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I will remind the member that asked the question that I believe his party voted against the patient caregiver program last year, but uh, we'll, I'll carry on to the question. Uh, we are in the final stages. It is final. It will be approved, I would say, within days. Uh, it's important that it's phase one. It will, it will focus on long-term care eligible patients and long-term care supportive patient, patients, which will use our inter-eye tool for assessments. Uh, so again, this is the first phase. I'll remind everyone Everybody in the house, this is the only the second one in the country. Nova Scotia does up to $400. Our program will be tiered um, up to $1,500. So it's very unique. It will help people stay home longer. It will reduce pressures on LTC. It will reduce pressures on our ER. This is a great program. I can't wait to launch it. Thank you, Madam. I could later on stand up as a point of privilege because that minister just said that we voted against the Home Givers Grant and we did not. We voted against the budget because you didn't do enough. You didn't do enough. There's parts of the program that we, that we like. There's parts of every budget that we like. We were the ones that were advocating for this program for years. Exactly. Yes. So. Could I have some order, please, in the House? I remember if you have a point of privilege, please uh, be, feel free to, to stand up and, and do that, and we will deal with it. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So I do stand on the point of privilege. I thought we had to do it after question period, but I'll do it now. Um, the Minister just said that I voted against this particular program. Madam Speaker, I've been an advocate for it for years. Honourable Member, point of privilege after question period, but you're bringing it up during questions. So if you, if you have a point of privilege, please feel free to do that. Carry on with your question. Okay. I didn't ask a question. Didn't ask a question. Could you please ask okay. your question? Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm going to continue on with this, and I'll bring up that later. Um, many Islanders were quite pleased to hear about this program. Actually, the people I talked about, they voted for this government on that one particular promise. So we have an aging population, and many family members have to spend a great deal of time looking after loved ones. It often means that the in, their incomes are reduced because of those pressures. But even more importantly, Madam Speaker, the fact is that so many Islanders are willing to look after their family. That's less pressure on our health care system and long-term care. Why did the minister bring in a $5.2 million spending request to this house, which was approved and did not launch the program? Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I would agree that we want this program sooner than later. It's important if you support people uh, at home that we do it in a proper way. I've talked about uh, we have a submission into Revenue Canada about the taxability of the funds that actually will be delivered from this program. Health and Wellness does not really have an engine to disperse funds, so we've reached out to uh, the uh, social uh, seniors and social development to actually use the, uh, actually deliver those payments, so there is a lot to this. The assessment process was difficult. I think it's important. I think it's going to be very important as we launch the program to explain the assessment uh, criteria and how it will be done and how it will flow. This is, uh, we want to get it right. Uh, we don't want to change programs because families will rely on this support and will make decisions based on this support, so we want to get it right. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm going to the opposition. So thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So during the budgetary estimates last year, this was what the minister said, and I quote, there's about $5 million in the budget to administer it in the first year, and I think we'll continue to add levels to that program. So not only did this minister add levels, he didn't even start the program one year after it. One year. So, minister, what is the issue? 
Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you. With a, for the sake of repeating myself again, this is a very comprehensive and difficult program. Um, we want to get it right the first time. We understand it's important we communicate with the public who is eligible and who is not eligible. Um, the, the goals of the program are fantastic in order to give the best care we can um, to those people that uh, need it and support the people who give it. So again, we will get it and we'll get it right and you will see it in the very, very near future. Thank you, Madam Speaker. End of question period. <clears throat> Honourable Member. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and I don't have my rule book with me, but I stand on a point of privilege. And my question is, the Minister of Health and Wellness said that um, myself and my colleagues on this side of the House did not support the uh, caregivers program in last year's budget. And Madam Speaker, that is untrue. We've been advocates for it for years. Thank you. And I ask that you put a, do a rule on that and ask them to retract that thing. Thank you. Yeah. Honourable Member, yeah. I will take that under advisement and get back to you. End of question period. Uh, Honourable Members. <laughs> Honourable Members, we're going to go to statements by members. <laughs> Beginning with the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Got a little distracted by the, the chatter here. <laughs> Madam Speaker, the government of Prince Edward Island wants to make our permitting processes as easy and efficient uh, as possible for residents while ensuring developments are safe. Beginning this week, PEI residents looking to build accessory structures like decks or sheds on their properties can receive permit approval instantly. People can apply online or in person at one of our four provincial land offices. After the completed application is reviewed by staff and the fee is paid, people can leave with their permit the same day. The previous average median wait time for sheds was 21 days and for decks, 11 days. This is just the first step in our plan to provide approval instantly for straightforward and routine permits, a commitment outlined in the Department of Housing, Land and Communities mandate letter. We'll continue to find ways to streamline provincial permitting so that developments can move forward in a timely manner. In the last few days, in the last few years, sorry, we've made significant enhancements to policy and staffing to approve, improve our permit process. Changes last year to the Building Codes Act regulations enabled junior building officials to be appointed. This has resulted in faster building permits. This means that in most cases, the building permit is ready to be issued at the same time as the development permit. We've also added new staff members who can help applicants through the process and ensure their submissions are clear, concise, and complete. Our median wait time right now for building and development permits is 21 days. And that's reduced uh, substantially over just last year. While our wait times are better than in most surrounding jurisdictions, we continue to strive for improvement. We do not want to be the barrier to much needed development. The, the 2024-25 operating budget includes an additional $300,000 to hire four new housing development workers, including electrical inspectors and client service staff to further improve our permit wait times. Madam Speaker, faster approvals can lead to quicker builds, which will create more homes for Islanders, easing some of the pressure on the housing market. We'll continue to monitor our operations, find more ways to improve processing times, reduce red tape, and enhance client services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Madam Speaker, so yes, I know I hear from many, uh, many Islanders who uh, want to make the permit permitting uh, process uh, a lot easier, a lot faster, especially for those smaller projects, which are sheds, uh, um, swimming pools, or what have you, that's uh, any kind of infrastructure that is small and it's on their property. Um, that can be, can be done rather quickly. The only thing is I have a few questions with it and, and that I'm looking forward to later on maybe when more details are released and that's the $100 fee that goes with the application. Is that above and beyond what the development permit fee is? Does that include, um, does this include municipalities that already have an official plan who do the permanent process, uh, process themselves? How does that impact them? Are they are participants in this program or not? And uh, the four new staff, where are those staff going to be located? So I have a few questions that uh, I would like to be answered before I really give this my full approval. Thank you. 
Gentleman from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I, I welcome this announcement. The Minister and I had a very constructive conversation about this during debate of, of the estimates just the other day. And uh, I saw the announcement regarding the removal of or uh, the opportunity for islanders to have instant permits when it comes to decks and very small sheds. And, and this is good. The, these are not projects that uh, pose any potential threat to islanders. They will never be occupied. They're, they're simple projects and often done um, by homeowners themselves, DIY. Um, one, so I'm, I'm glad to see that. And, and anything we can do to reduce the red tape involved uh, when islanders are, are building these days are better. Now, of course, the decks and the sheds, the, the mini sheds that the, the, this, permit is, this immediate permitting process refers to uh, will not provide any housing for islanders. And there's been a recommendation on the books now for s some time from the forestry, uh, um, the forestry Commission, the, the, oh my gosh, am I right about the name of that? The, yeah, the, the PEI Forestry Commission. In their first interim report, they suggested that the province uh, permit 625 square foot buildings using local wood, which has not happened yet. They allow that in New Brunswick. Now, 625 is not a big house, of course, but it's a potential dwelling. I have a son who lives in a tiny house that's just over 200 square feet. So if government were to actually move forward on that permitting process, as they have been advised to do, recommended to do by the Forestry Commission, then not only would we be removing red tape, but we would be facilitating the construction of potential homes for islanders. So this is great, but I think there's more we can do. And you're just following on the advice of a commission that was set up by the Minister of Environment. And I really hope that you look at that. And much as I welcome this, I think there are other things that we could do that we could be equally, if not more, effective. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Social Development, Seniors. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, I rise today to let folks, to let them know that they need to beware and get your share. It's a time of year again that tax season is upon us. Filing our taxes is important and it means people may qualify for benefits. Madam Speaker, Islanders living on low or modest income or receiving social assistance may not think it is worth filing their taxes. That is why the Department of Social Development and Seniors runs the Beware Get Your Share campaign this time of year. Our message to Islanders is that if they simply file their income tax return, they can get their share from government programs. These include federal benefits like the Canada Child Benefit, the Guaranteed Income Supplement, the Canada Workers Benefit, and the GST HST credit. It is also key to accessing provincial government programs, to name a few, the upcoming PEI Children's Benefit, the Generic Drug Pro Program, the Dental Care Program, the Free Heat Pump Program, the Hearing Aid Rebate Program, the Seniors Independence Initiative Program, the Home Repair Programs. Many provincial programs like these require a notice of assessment to be eligible, which can only be obtained from the Canada Revenue Agency after you file your income tax return. There is assistance for individuals who need help filing their income tax. From now until the end of April, there are free confidential tax help clinics running in community centers and libraries across the island. These clinics are a collaboration between volunteers from community organizations and the CRA. Islanders with low to modest income uh, and simple tax situations are eligible, el eligible for these free clinics. Super clinics are also being offered this year. At these clinics, additional service providers um, will be on hand to offer information and support, including a seniors navigator, the Office of Net Zero, Efficiency PEI, and more. Madam Speaker, these are important initiatives to, make, to help make sure Islanders don't miss out on federal and provincial benefits that can provide much needed support. For more information, Islanders can visit princeedwardisland.ca slash getyourshare. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And it's uh, my pleasure to stand and, and, and speak about uh, this great, great program. And it's a great initiative that was put forward by the Liberal government in 2017. And it was a program that encouraged people to file their income tax returns uh, to gain access to federal and provincial uh, benefits. Uh, so be aware and be aware and get your share campaign is aimed to get people, of course, to file their income tax regardless of whether or not they were paying any income tax in or not. Um, the returns can make individuals eligible for different government programs that were mentioned by the minister along with uh, other programs like the allowance for survivor under the OSA program or the education money uh, through the Canadian Learning Bond. So I do encourage all Islanders to uh, to file uh, their income tax and take advantage of the free tax clinics that are being provided right across the island and in particular any one of my constituents uh, check out the Tignish uh, Public Library as they are doing them there. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you Madam Speaker and I think that, that this is a great uh, program, very important program. And uh, when I went to, to check it out a bit further on the website I really liked how it was broken down and it talked about if you're in this position, what, what different um, benefits or uh, credits are available to you. So it breaks down things for parents of, of one child, parents with more than one child. It talks about if you're a caregiver for uh, a spouse or a common law or a, par a dependent with a physical or mental impairment, um, single people without children, seniors, post-secondary students, recent post-secondary grads. Um, it, it breaks it down for you on different things that are available to you and I know that that is one of the reasons that I would never do my taxes by myself because I don't know enough about what is available to me and this is a really good uh, layout of, of what that is so very very helpful and like has been mentioned I encourage everyone to get to get your taxes done and, and why not take advantage of being able to get that done for free with people who understand these programs when you go to the website there's a list of several different places that are doing them if you don't have access to a computer I'll give there's just the number for social development and seniors toll free 1-866-594-3777 and they can direct you where you need to go thank you madam speaker the Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, the, these are this is a timely uh, announcement today Close after listening to the questions and questions, period, Madam Speaker, about the modernization of manure management guidelines. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to rise today to announce another great initiative that will support our agricultural industry. Over the past year, we've been very focused on what we can do to grow, especially our livestock se uh, sector and enhancing our soil health. After a lot of hard work and input from agricultural specialists, our friends in the Department of Agriculture, in the Department of Environment, technical groups, and of course, our agriculture industry, we are ready to post our updated modernized manure management guidelines. Those guidelines provide direction to government, the agricultural industry, and members of the public on recommended manure management practices. Some of the modernized changes include increasing storage capacity, adjustments to separation for agriculture and non-agricultural purpose, addition of, climate, of a climate lens to help achieve our provincial goals, and add help from specialists to our agricultural industry. Madam Speaker, we are uh, committed to doing everything we can do to support our agricultural industry, and we know the importance of life, our livestock sector. And we all know the importance of manure for our soil health and for our environment. I am pleased to have these guidelines updated, and I know that there will be a complement of existing programs to our provincial livestock strategy and our soil health initiatives. Finally, I'm really pleased all viewing manure of the valuable resource that it is, rather than simply waste a product. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yeah, member for Morton, uh, Kinkora. Thank you, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I appreciate the, the uh, announcement from, uh, from the minister. Uh, Minister uh, obviously knows a lot more about manure than I do. Uh, uh, it's just true. Uh, but, uh, 
Uh, so, so the, my, I guess, uh, Madam Speaker, I'd simply uh, echo the remarks uh, of the minister in the sense that you know, ma ma manure managed properly is not waste, it's not garbage. Uh, it's a val valuable uh, resource for uh, reintroduction into the, into, the, into the agricultural community, into the farms. And uh, the, more, the more of that uh, natural product that we get to reinsert into the crop rotation is, uh, reduces the uh, amount we need of uh, chemical inputs and chemical fertilizers, and also irrigation when we have improved soil health. So uh, I think the, uh, the document uh, will provide great guidance uh, to producers and uh, uh, to make good use of this valuable resource. And I appreciate the 113-page uh, the, uh, the, the uh, November 2023 edition. Uh, is, I, I understand that being re replaced with this one, uh, Mr. Minister. It's, it's not that old, uh, but I guess there's updates, uh, updates with this new announcement. Thank you. Presenting and receiving petitions. Tabling of documents. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Madam Speaker, by Leader of the House, I beg leave. <coughs> Table of uh, FOI. A list of the family doctors practicing the PEI and the number of patients registered by each doctor. And I move second by the member from Charlottetown West Royalty that the said document be now received in due lie on the table. Shall I carry? Right. <coughs> the Honourable Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Uh, Madam Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table. Answers to written questions 77, 78, 79, and 80. And I move seconded by the Honorable Minister of Finance that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall it carry? Carry. The Honorable Minister of Housing, Land, and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg leave to table budget estimate takebacks for the Department of Housing, Land, and Communities from March 12th. I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Phil Carey. <laughs> Reports by committees. Introduction to government bills. Motions other than government. The member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah, uh, at this time, I call motion 101 back to the floor. Phil Carey. Madam Speaker. Motion 101 is currently under debate, and debate was adjourned by the Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. The Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker, and thank you again to Charlottetown West Royalty for bringing this motion forward and uh, for the debate that we had yesterday. Uh, I'm not going to speak for long, but I, I'm going to start off at the top of this motion with the, uh, the title, which is Prescription for Change. Urgent action needed for PEI healthcare crisis, and I couldn't agree more. And one of the concerns that I have persistently, and I expressed it this afternoon, related to the housing crisis, but it's equally applicable to the state of our healthcare system, is when I hear governments say, you know, it's but it's bad everywhere, and uh, it's, it's some sort of get out of jail card for the fact that we have issues with whether it's housing or health care here on Prince Edward Island. And, and the truth in most instances is that it's worse here than it needs to be, and it's worse here than it should be because of inaction by this government or action which was ineffective. And again, I talked about the housing file this afternoon uh, during question period, but I'm going to strip my comments to health care here. And during the, last fed, uh, during the last campaign here on the island, uh, the first question at the televised leaders debate was, what, what, what is the one thing that you would do to fix the health care crisis on PEI? And of course, there is no one thing that's going to fix the crisis. But it's certainly when, you have, when you're live and you have a camera on your face and you have to answer a question like that, it focuses your mind. And I actually gave an answer which included two things. And the first thing was that we need to pay our frontline workers more, all of our frontline workers more. And we had budgeted for a 15% increase across the line. It was a huge budget line. But we know that one of the reasons we lose healthcare, frontline healthcare workers here is because we're not competitive with our wages. So until we rectify that, then we are always going to be vulnerable to two things, being difficult to attract people to come here and keeping the people who are already working within our healthcare system. So that was the first thing I said. And the second thing I said was to fix governance in Prince Edward Island of the healthcare system and stop the meddling. And I think had we done those things, not just 
last year when they were brought up during the leaders' debate. But had we done them five years ago, and this government, let's not forget, has had five years to work on these difficult files. I'm not going to stand here and suggest that this is an easy thing. It's absolutely not. It's terribly difficult, terribly complicated, and requires an enormous amount of work and creativity and, and good policy. Um, but I am going to say that had we acted on those two things five years ago, I can stand here and very confidently say that the crisis within our healthcare system would not be as bad as it is now. It would be there. We'd have struggles as they have in Nova Scotia and Ontario and BC and Europe and everywhere else. But we could have managed it better and it would have been less severe. I absolutely believe that. One thing we do have here, which is uh, an, enormous, an enormous benefit, is that we have an extraordinary workforce within the healthcare system. And despite the fact that they are sometimes not treated as respectfully as they should be, despite the fact that they don't earn as much money as their counterparts in neighboring provinces, despite the fact that they are not given the same sorts of latitude when it comes to vacation time and, and being flexible with their shifts, despite all that, their commitment to the healthcare system here on PEI remains absolutely unwavering and steadfast. And uh, the Honourable Member from Borden Kinkora and myself met with some critical care and nurses um, just a couple of weeks ago. And I was struck by a few things. One was, in light of the incredible pressures that they face in their job, they are some of the nurses who are maintaining the PCU, what used to be an ICU at the Prince County Hospital, that a year ago the vacancy rate for critical care nurses at the PCH, and this motion calls specifically about the state of affairs at the, at the Prince County Hospital, the vacancy rate a year ago was 10% in their department. <coughs> and this year, just 12 months later, it's pushing 70%. And those that are left, the uh, full complement for that unit is 16 full-time equivalent critical care nurses. And there are now somewhere between five and six, a number off on maternity leave, a number off on stress leave, not sure whether they will come back. And that's, despite that, um, the nurses we met with who are still working in the system um, said, and, the, and, and they closed our, our conversation by saying, we want to make this right, we want to make this better. And that commitment to the system and to their patients and to their colleagues in the, in the system was quite inspiring to me. And that's something we have to build on here on Prince Edward Island, but we do need a government that acknowledges, recognizes the depth of the problem and is willing to come forward and make those difficult choices and, and creative programs and policies and legislative changes that we need in order to improve governance here on Prince Edward Island and to make every single one of our, our workers in the front line feel that they are as as respected and, and honoured as they, as they should be. Uh, I I'm, don't know uh, whether anybody else is going to speak to this motion. Clearly, I, I support it wholeheartedly. It, it is an echo of one that we spoke to last week, but sometimes it's worth repeating yourself. And I think in this case, for the residents of the western end of this island and the central portion also, in fact, all islanders, because each part of our health system is interdependent on the next. Um, so for the health of our healthcare system and for all islanders, it's critical that the Prince County Hospital be restored to full health. And that means nothing short of an ICU unit, which is fully operational. Again, I thank the member for bringing this forward. I fully support it and I look forward to the vote. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Is there anyone else to speak to the motion? I'll go back to the Honourable Member for Charlotte Thomas Durrell to close debate. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for all members who spoke to this, uh, <coughs> this important motion. And I think that our health care system and, and what the PCH experienced last year was, was right there. And we all saw it, and we had to, we had to, we had to and have to continue to support that hospital and all the services they provide, but especially, without reserve, bringing back the ICU. 
and it's going to take a lot of work, and it's for the people in that area. And although we heard it, and we're so there was some talk about how we can all get together. We have been talking about about the, these facilities for a very long time, and that's that's the that's the job of the opposition to bring these forward. And I think I think that um, both parties in opposition did that. And right now, it's up to government to 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 stop making excuses and difficult difficult issues, and make sure they find a solution. And some of the solutions and the one in place is. If you look at the definition of a locum, it's not, it's a substitute. A substitute meaning a replacement, a replacement for something. But, but we need something there. We need a workforce. You can't substitute and have had nobody to back it up. That's not what a locum is for. So we need to make sure that we have a sustainable plan to make sure that the people of Summerside are well served. Um, Madam Speaker. To end debate, uh, last night, this is about Islanders, and this is about Islanders in, uh, from Summerside West and everybody that served from PCH. And, and last night, uh, when I got home, I, I, I got a message, and I think that uh, I'm just going to read it to close debate because we have to remember why, why, this, is, why this is there. So I just thought, uh, this is from an Islander. I just watched the debate on the PCH healthcare crisis. And I wanted to share my experience recently. On Friday, March 8th, at approximately 11.45 a.m., I needed to call an ambulance due to severe pain in my chest and having difficulty breathing. I live in Slumman Park, and I also live alone. I'm 61 years old. After the paramedics assessed me, it was determined that I needed to go to the hospital. I was quite surprised when they told me they were taking me to the QEH, as the PCH was diverting all ambulances to other hospitals. I did not need an ICU, but to be diagnosed to what the problem was causing the pain I was in. I live about seven minutes from the PCH, but I had to take a 45-minute ride to the QEH in an ambulance. The paramedics were excellent. I have no complaints about their care I received. I was triaged at the hospital and set out in the waiting room to wait. I finally got called to the back after waiting for five hours in a wheelchair. After a number of tests, I was given a prescription and released around 9 p.m. I was basically, at that point, I was basically stranded in Charlottetown. I am on assistance and have to find my own way back to Summerside. A taxi was too expensive, but luckily I found someone to drive me home for gas money. Money that was destined for food, but oh well, at least I got home. I just wanted to share my experience. I feel I shouldn't have to to drive by my local hospital, to be left on my own, and struggle to get back home from Charlottetown to Summerside. Please keep advocating for the PCH. Regards. On that note, I want to say that we're listening to Islanders, and it's about them. So continue to send messages like this along, and we will do everything we can on this side and hopefully on all sides of this house to make sure that, uh, that PCH, Summerside, Everybody in between has heard about our health care system. At this time, I will call for a standing vote. Thank you, Honorable Member. A recorded division has been requested. Sergeant Arms, please ring the bell. Speaker, the official opposition is ready for the vote. Madam uh, Speaker, the third party is ready for the vote.
Madam Speaker, government's ready for the vote. Honourable members, all those voting against the motion, please stand. Honourable members, those supporting the motion, please stand. Minister of Finance, the member from Kensington Malpac, the Minister of Energy, Environment, and Climate Action, Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, member from Charlottetown Winslow, Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture, Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population, Minister of Social Development and Seniors, Minister of Housing, Land and Communities, the Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade, the member from Borden King Cora, the Honorable Leader of the Third Party, the member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition, member from Rustico Emerald, member from Surrey Elmira, member from New Haven Rocky Point, member from Summerside Wilmot, the Honorable member from Time Valley Sherbrooke, the member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Honorable members, the motion has passed and it is unanimous. Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I call Motion 62 back. Well, carry. Motion 62, open island shelter locations 24 hours a day, and debate was adjourned by the mover, the Honourable Member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise to speak again to this important motion, which I think is crucial for Prince Edward Island. And if you look back over the last little while, we've gone in the opposite direction. And this is about opening shelters up 24 hours a day. When people ask us what can we do to help our housing crisis, um, what can we do to provide people stability at, at a very difficult time in their lives, it's opening up shelters 24 hours a day. We continuously, we continuously talk about it, um, about uh, a way forward. The government has their own report from 2019 on homelessness, which recommends this exact same thing. The Standing Committee on Health and Social Development has recommended this exact same thing. But what does government do? They move in the opposite direction from that. And there's no case more paramount than um, I have both contracts for, um, for uh, Bedford McDonald on my desk. And we see from the one from 2000 um, in, in 21 that the facility was open for 24 hours a day, then slowly cut to 16 hours a day. And this is a 10 bed facility that was cut to 16 hours a day. Finally, it said at that point, we said we will do a review um, of the services. And before you know it, boom cut to 12 hours a day, and that's where it lies now. It makes no sense. It makes no sense to have people lining up in, in Charlottetown and different places at 8 o'clock at night um, in a lineup to try to get a shelter bed. It, it has no consistency to provide people support. It doesn't. I, I don't know if, if we can argue against that. I don't know if it's the direction we want to take as a province, but it's, it's there. It's, it's the, the, the facts are clear. So we open, up, um, we open up Park Street, a 48-unit facility that was late, co over, cost overruns were there, um, it, it, it met a need and demand, but that facility opens, only opens up 12 hours a day. And instead of opening this facility up for 24 hours a day when it was there, and opening up Bedford McDonald House, and opening up Blooming House, and opening up other facilities for, for 12, what do we do? We, we go and spend $6.7 million dollars to build more, to build more uh, facilities to move the outreach center there when you didn't even try to open up your, your shelter supports 24 hours a day across the board. It makes no sense. So now we have a facility, we have a facilities that's there for somebody for 12 hours a day, and now we just we, we went to the expense um, of, of building another facility for $6.6 .6 million a day without listening to the community. And so people are, are supposed to go from one to the next. Um, that's if they can get into the compound area itself, because there's major restrictions on that too as well. I mean, the staff are working hard, but how are you going to provide consistency with the people that need it the most? These are the questions that I have and I've yet to have answers to. 
Um, we've, we've signed contracts with organizations. We've got reports that are pending that should have been released before the contracts were signed. We've got environmental, um, environmental reviews that seemed like the government was waiting on for those to happen before they took action. And those didn't come in and action was taken. The whole thing, I, I cannot, I've watched every single timeline and I, I don't understand it. A lot has been done, but it could have been better coordinated and it could have been more inclusive and government could have taken more of a lead on, on managing this file from start to finish. Are we going to, what are we doing in Summerside? Is that facility going to be a 24 hour shelter um, like it was talked about in their council meetings, like asking questions about that? Um, an, uh, an RFP went out. I don't know who won the contract. I don't know when the shelter was going to be open. All I know was that this government had plenty of time to open the shelter up before the snow was flying. And the snow has flown, f flew, flied, whatever you want to call it. And here we are, no shelter. Now we're talking in past tense right now. And that's not acceptable. We still don't have a plan. We're into March. I don't understand it. We got a government that we got a government that announced in the capital budget a 25-bed shelter facility. It was announced in the capital budget. And then what do we do? We're on the floor. Nope, that got reduced. Who cut the amount of shelter beds between the time it was reported in the budget and then it came on the floor? Nope, we're not doing that. And what the answer was, we're cutting that down to 10 beds. Who cut? Who cut 14 shelter beds? Was it the Minister of Finance or the Minister of Housing? And then what do we get? We get, nope, we're going to add transitional housing space. Those are two separate budget lines. Those are two separate budget lines. Those are two different things. It doesn't provide consistency. And what do we know right now? Yes, so we've opened up a, a, a few extra beds at a shelter, but you had promised a shelter and didn't deliver. And the people in Summerside needed it. It's right there in front of you, and we, we have to make sure that <coughs> if you are to vote against this, you, have to, you better have a good reason because I've talked about this, standing committees have talked about this, your own, your own consultants have talked about this as an avenue to provide stability to people who need it the most at the times they need it the most. We can fix this problem. We can fix this problem for Islanders. We can be there for them, but we have to make sure it's consistent. We have to make sure they feel, they feel valued and heard and, and supported and at the time when they need it the most because ministers, government, people are falling more into poverty in our island than they are getting out. And that is bothersome. So with this motion, I ask you to wholeheartedly think about it, and I look forward to hearing from uh, different members about this important motion. And it's something that we have to dig our heels in and say, you know what, we can do this. We can open up our shelters 24 hours a day and provide stability. And I mean, there will be excuses. There will be counter arguments. I understand that. I look forward to hearing them. But I haven't heard a good one as to why we shouldn't do this. And that's what, I, that's what needs to be done right now. We need to have a debate on the floor, and I look forward to hearing it. Um, uh, Madam Speaker, thank you for your time. I'm glad to move this important motion. I look forward to seeing how the vote goes. Thank you. Seconding the motion, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I want to first begin by thanking the member from Charlottetown, <coughs> Metroidy, for bringing this motion forward. It's something that he's very passionate about. It's a file that he uh, knows a lot about. Um, he's probably one of the few in this room that actually get out uh, on the streets with those people who actually need uh, this uh, service of, of shelter. And that's why he's so passionate about it. He comes back here, he, he really feels for these people. And obviously, with every question that he does ask in the house, he does it from the heart. And that's one thing that I do truly appreciate uh, being a colleague of his and having him on our, on our team. He does, he does bring something uh, to our caucus 
um, that, uh, that, that truly uh, has a better understanding of those uh, most vulnerable on Prince Edward Island and, and those in need. So I, I thank him for that. I thank him for bringing this motion forward. So I, I obviously am in support of this motion. Um, there are many islanders who deserve to have 24-hour shelter. I mean, I'm going to start off by, by basically saying we take care of our animals on Prince Edward Island than we do Islanders, Madam Speaker. The Animal Welfare Act that's legislated here on Prince Edward Island um, that s states that animals must be provided with shelter and also that they must be, have access to proper uh, veterinary care, um, Madam Speaker. These are things that, that it just blows my mind to think that an animal on Prince Edward Island gets better care than a human being on Prince Edward Island, especially those people who are very vulnerable and people who are down and out on their luck and are just looking for that little, that little help up, that little step up, um, and they're not getting, it, not getting it from this government. 24 hour shelter for, for Islanders who are homeless is not really that big of an ask when you, when you look, at, at the, look at it, Madam Speaker. Homelessness does not look the same to everyone. So many people can be homeless for an extended period of time or some for a very short period of time. Homelessness is not to, doesn't look the same in urban areas as it does in rural areas. Um, we don't even actually know a true number of homelessness here on Prince Edward Island. But what we need to do, what we need to do is provide for those who are most vulnerable and give them access to shelter, give them access to whatever program is possible to help them get that, that, that step up, Madam Speaker. And that's what they're looking for. Um, it's something that we've been on this side of the House um, asking for. I mentioned about the, the member uh, who put this motion forward from Charlottetown West Royalty for five years, has been in this House, and this has been one of his top uh, concerns and one of the, the top issues that he has been advocating for, um, and nothing has happened yet, Madam Speaker, and it needs to happen. More and more, we drive through um, any municipality here in Prince Edward Island, we can see people who need that support, who need a 24-hour shelter, and they don't have it, Madam Speaker. So you take yesterday, for instance, or the past few days, and I talked earlier in my opening remarks about the weather up home, um, how it rained and it snowed off and on um, for the past 36, 40 hours. And those individuals who do not have access to 24-hour shelter, and let's say they have temporary shelter for 12 hours, well, what do they do for the other 12 hours, Madam Speaker? They can't be out on the street. Just imagine um, anyone in this room, imagine yourself being put in that situation. I mean, we come in from our vehicle parked across the street, and we're like, oh, it's raining, it's terrible out, I'm wet, it's cold, blah, blah, blah. Imagine being out there for 12 hours, Madam Speaker. That's the issue that is not being addressed, and we need a government to address this issue, to take it serious. There's been recommendations made to this government on 24-hour, um, seven days a week shelter made by consultants, made by the Standing Committee, and it's falling upon deaf ears. Madam Speaker, this government just seems to be not up to the job. They need to be... Um, we need a government that, that has empathy and a willingness to help those uh, in our society who do not have adequate access to, to shelter. So it's a simple ask, and in this m particular motion, it's just asking the government to engage with local shelters, with uh, experts and, and stakeholders, to ensure that the review process and the subsequent implementation of a 24-hour shelter services are informed by the best practices and meet the, sp the specific needs of the community, and that the government give consideration to providing a progress report to the public within 30 days detailing the steps taken to open shelter locations 24 hours a day here on Prince Edward Island. So, Madam Speaker, I will end my remarks on this because I really want to hear uh, from other members in this House uh, who hopefully will uh, stand up and address these concerns that they're hearing within their own districts and also to hear what government plans to do um, to help these most vulnerable in our society. Thank you. 
I have the Honourable Leader of the Third Party on my list. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I want to thank uh, both the mover and seconder of this motion. It's something that we've also been calling for for a long time, so of course support this 100%. Um, as was mentioned, but something that I just can't get over is the fact that this is a recommendation that has been made in two different reports. One commissioned by the government, um, I believe it was a report written in 2019, and then again one done by the Rotary Club in Montague. And both of those um, reports reference two recommendations that stick out for me. One of those being that these services be 24 hours a day, and the second part of that being that these services be offered in the communities in which people live, work, um, have family, have friends, have a support network, if they're lucky. And that's one of my biggest issues with the way this government has rolled out services for people who are currently unhoused. Assuming that everyone can get to Charlottetown, kind of growing a hub in Charlottetown, taking people away from their support networks and their friends, forcing people to be actually even more vulnerable than they would be in their own communities, having them to form new um, friendships and, and, and new communities, which um, is just not a healthy position to put people in. And so those are two things that I will continue to fight for because I don't Un homelessness doesn't just exist in Charlottetown. I know that um, the Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Culture and Sport, Sport thank you, uh, has mentioned a couple of times, and I know that there are active advocates in his community looking to, to open up a shelter, but instead the people who live there have to come to Charlottetown. The people in Tignesh, if they're experiencing homelessness and they would like some assistance support, they have to come to Charlottetown. Unless... The other funny part about that, too, is rather than accommodating people in their own communities, government would rather pay for a taxi to get them to and from Charlottetown. And A, that's a whole lot of money that we are, I mean, I guess it's not a waste because people have a safe place to sleep, but at the same time, it's a huge waste of government money when they could just think of other options. Um, and the other part of that is that... Um, we are not taking into consideration that many people who are unhoused have caretaking responsibilities. They have jobs. And so expecting that that is, that this cookie cutter um, solution works for people is absurd. Um, and one doesn't have to look far to see the injustices of not having shelters for tw open 24 hours a day. If you drive by Bedford McDonald is a prime example. It's yeah. such a shame. People are lined up with their life possessions, mm -hmm. standing in a line just hoping that there will be a bed for them there that night. And it's, in, it's completely inhumane. Mm -hmm. And the fact that, you know, this is not new. Government knows that, this, that people are lining up outside, regardless of the weather, mm -hmm. to, to, to hopefully get a bed. But there's been nothing done to address that yet. And so the level of human inhumanity that the government is allowing people to live in is, is, is shocking. Um, I know one of the excuses that we've heard when we've talked about this before is the fact like, well, we don't have to open up shelters 24-7 because we have the community outreach center during the day. How many times have we heard that not everyone feels comfortable accessing community outreach center? If you're the un under the age of 18, you can't access um, the community outreach center. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why that excuse is simply just that, an excuse. Um, and if we actually took the opportunity to go and visit the Community Outreach Centre, I know that some of, my, some of the members in here have, but you don't have to talk, go very far to have conversations with people who are experiencing homelessness to hear one of two things when you ask them what they would like to see. And depending on kind of where they are, they'll either say they want 24 our access to the shelter to a shelter or that they want access to safe appropriate affordable housing which is something that they currently don't have and let's not kid ourselves 
The amount of people accessing services at our shelters is growing exponentially because of our housing crisis. And until we actually see some substantial action, some su substantial changes made there, this number is going to continue to grow. And are we going to be, is government going to be happy just continuing to ship, take people out of their communities and ship them to Charlottetown? I certainly hope not. Um, so another thing that I've heard about closing shelters and, and only keeping them open 12 hours a day is that, well, we have to keep them moving. And I have to say, there's not a whole lot more that offends me more than that. When I consider the fact that I'm a human being and sometimes I get sick. Mm -hmm. I'm a human being and I don't count on the fact that I'm always going to have my health. I've heard stories of people who have colostomy bags, changing their colostomy bags in mud puddles because they don't have access to a clean space to do that because they are experiencing homelessness. And keeping people moving. So like, you know, it doesn't matter what the weather's like outside. I just don't understand that. And I, I wish that I, someone could explain because I've heard it a few times from government members and I've heard it from, from others as well. And I, I wish someone could explain that to me because if that's the excuse that we're using, I think that that's a very poor excuse. Um, I guess with that, I will just, uh, of course I support this motion. I guess I would just ask people to think about, you know, if you wake up in the morning and you're sick, I think we all take for granted, including myself, what, but actually less and less so when I, when I see what's happening in my community. And I wake up in the morning and I'm sick. And I can take a sick day mm -hmm. and I can lay on my couch. I don't even have to stay on my bed because I have a couple of options. I can lay on my couch, I can watch TV, I can read a book, I can run to the washroom when I need to. Those are luxuries in this day and age and that's really sad. So um, with that, I think that, of course, with this motion, when we look at um, to assess the quality, accessibility, and overall effectiveness of the current shelter services, I think that is really important for improvements to be made. Um, I think that ensuring that the that shelters have the resources to stay open 24-7, it might change um, a little bit the resources and the spaces need, needed. And then, of course, uh, to review, talk to stakeholders to ensure that the review process and Im implementation of 24-hour shelter services um, is informed by best practices and meet that the very specific needs of the community. Um, and so, of course, with that, I support this motion 100%. I recognize challenges for government, but I'm sure there's no challenges that you can't find solutions to. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Is there anyone else to speak to the motion? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Um, I think I might take the podium, just for convenience here. Madam Speaker, um, as the uh, mover of this motion mentioned um, in his response uh, the last time this motion was called, um, the province has hired a, a special advisor to the Premier and Executive Council uh, to look at the issue of Islanders with complex needs. Um, Carlene Donnelly, a, she's an Islander and she has three decades of experience as a senior leader in the social services sector. And she's been asked to evaluate the current uh, programs and services being offered in the province. Um, and specifically those who are in precarious housing situations, vulnerable situations, complex needs, and um, that would uh, include shelter services. So 
this work by an expert advisor is is being conducted right now, and I'm I'm just looking at the um, the requests within the the resolution itself or the motion, and it says conduct an independent, thorough, and transparent review of all the shelter services. So that is happening as part of Ms. Donnelly's work. Um, Give consideration to allocating the necessary resources and funding for immediate implementation of 24-hour shelter services. Well, we're certainly looking at, um, that's certainly again part of her work about how we, uh, the, the model of service delivery, how we allocate our resources. Uh, engage with local shelters and experts and stakeholders, ensure the review process and sub subsequent implementation are informed by best practices. Well. She certainly brings decades of uh, informed best practice uh, with her around this entire issue. And um, much of her time spent on the ground here has been uh, meeting with uh, stakeholders in the whole sector and people delivering services to our vulnerable population. Um, you know, and she has uh, certainly um, identified some deficiencies in the way that we're doing things here and delivering services. And uh, but on the flip side of that, uh, it's very encouraging that she has identified individuals and specific um, services and operations that are operating at a very uh, high level or with very good expertise and awareness and um, community support. Uh, so I would say she's identified some very uh, good models that we can that we can replicate um, across the province. So much of uh, what's in the uh, the motion, give consideration to providing a progress report to the public within 30 days detailing the steps taken. Like, that is actually going to happen. We will, I expect within 30 days to have a, a final report from Ms. Donnelly uh, about her work in this, in this sector. So, you know, I'm supportive of much of what is asked for in this, um, in this motion. And my first thought, though, is that I'm, I'm not really inclined to make a decision here today by supporting this until I have final recommendations from Ms. Donnelly. Um, you know, perhaps a, an amendment that says, if this is what our special advisor uh, recommends to us, uh, that would probably be enough for me to... to uh, to get over that um, particular question. So Madam Speaker, the motion calls for 24-hour shelter services. Um, while uh, the look of that service may be different from what the honorable member envisions, there's, you know, and despite all of its deficiencies that I fully recognize, there currently is 24-hour day support. And in fact, some of, our, um, some of our shelters are open 24 hours a day. Um, Winter Street Men's, Men's Shelter in, in Summerside, which we recently added um, four, four beds to, uh, operates 24 hours a day. And the Lifehouse Women's Shelter, which has a, for women and children, that's right, um, it actually has a capacity. I was surprised to learn of, of 14 people. We've often said that there are, what, uh, just four bedrooms there. But they can actually accommodate up to 14 people at a time. So while I would say that there are services available 24 hours a day, it's true that um, some of our shelters uh, don't operate um, 24 hours a day. 
But the, the supports that are available, they include a mix of overnight shelter and daytime support and case management. And, um, you know, I'm not just referring to, uh, you know, when I talk about day supports, I'm not just talking about the, the outreach center, which is just here in Charlottetown, but all the various other services that are available in the community, which are part of Ms. Donnelly's work as well as how to build capacity in all of those services and bring those together into one cohesive system of care for people with complex needs so that they're fully supported to the, um, to the maximum capacity of all those services on the ground. Um, I heard um, the honorable member who moved this motion um, on the very first day, um, he said something that's, that's true and that should be recognized, and that is that shelter is not housing. Um, it is, we call it emergency shelter because it is there in, case, in cases of emergency. Uh, unfortunately, there are very quite a number of people who uh, experience emergency need for, for shelter on a daily basis. Um, you know, and we've talked about the fact that uh, people who fall into need of the shelter, emergency shelter services, um, often have a hard time finding their way out of that, um, that situation. Um, I guess you could say when you fall that low, it's hard to climb your way back up. And one strategy that's employed um, throughout my department and with our partners that deliver these services is well recognized. And I was reading about a, a, a shelter in Moncton who's very much focused on this now is that diversion is very much key. And working with people who seek emergency shelter you know, it should be a, a, a last resort and that if you work, often work with, uh, with people to, you know, it, do you have a family member who could take you in for the evening? Is there anywhere else you can go? Is, or is, is, is there a reason you can't, is there a home you can't go back to because of the situation there? Um, why is it you're seeking emergency shelter this evening? And, you know, everything should be done at that point in time to prevent somebody from having to seek um, emergency shelter. We have incredible community partners, <coughs> including the Salvation Army and Blooming House, the Adventure Group, Peers Alliance, Reach Foundation, Native Council, John Howard Society, uh, CMHA, just to name some. And we have service agreements with these partners, and they're reviewed to ensure needs are being met and gaps where they're identified are, uh, are addressed. And all our partners um, work together through coordinated access to support individuals experiencing homelessness or who are at risk of homelessness. And... Uh, uh, time has uh, been exhausted. If you could please adjourn debate with a seconder. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I move we adjourn debate, seconded by the Minister for Social Development and Seniors. Thank you. <coughs> Honourable Leader of the Third... I'm oh, sorry. Honourable Member from New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I call motion number, oh, I'm so sorry, motion number 86, 86. be read. Okay. Bill Carey. <coughs> Madam Speaker, motion 86 is currently under debate. Debate was adjourned by the, the Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. <coughs> You know, Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, podium to Anybody have the podium? Sorry. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, 
Obviously, uh, uh, this is a continuation of a discussion from uh, a, pr a previous day, so I'll try not to repeat uh, any of my comments um, from the previous debate. I appreciate the opportunity to get up uh, a second time uh, to talk about this. So, Madam Speaker, healthcare recruitment and retention has been an increasing challenge over the last number of years. Appropriate staffing is vital in all healthcare facilities for both the safety of the patients and the well-being of our workforce. Madam Speaker, this was before my time as Health Minister, but I am well aware that the retention incentives were provided to nursing staff at this time. This also included nurse practitioners, registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, resident care workers, and paramedics to ensure that we maintain the front health, frontline health care services Islanders needed during this nationwide health care shortage. At the time, there were specific areas identified as to where human resource needs and vacancies were most pressing. We were stop, trying to stop the bleeding at this time. As you recall, DBA was hiring RNs from our system and it was putting services for Islanders in jeopardy. The, this started in 2020 to help clear a backlog of disability claims and they didn't clear the backlog of more than two, 22,000 uh, disability uh, claims. They decided at that time to extend these positions in 2022 to complete 12,000 more disability claims at DVA. Also, basically from my time in finance, um, with the indexing of the pension, there was a motivation and a financial reward to maintain into our system uh, based on the high CPI uh, that we're seeing in our system that would be applied to our pension payments. So we had nearly 300 nurses eligible to retire previously, but we're waiting for January 1 to, to roll over so that they would qualify for a, high, a higher pension um, amount for the rest of their lives. So these incentives were provided in efforts to maintain the staff we had while working hard to recruit and fill existing vacancies across the healthcare system. Again, these were implemented to stabilize the system we often refer to them as bonuses, um, but we characterize it as a stabilization payment with a return in service component. I think that's important. We were trying to stem the flow of retirements and those positions that were moving to the federal government to maintain our system. Madam Speaker, I have heard personally from other health care workers and support staff that they felt this was unfair. I want to make it clear that we have so much appreciation for each and every healthcare worker and member of support staff who keep our system running each day. Without everyone, private and public, the system would not run. And the attention of this incentive was certainly not to imply anything otherwise. The incentives were only a part of an overall solution of strengthening our healthcare system at a time to put us in a more competitive position to recruit, retain, and provi provide quality health care services to Islanders. Madam Speaker, we are always looking to do better and look at ways we can improve our recruitment and retention practices. I highly value the feedback I've received through my Focus on the Frontline Tour, including the feedback I received on this incentive. Madam Speaker, I cannot support this motion as it's presented. I will, ever, however, continue to focus my time and energy on improving retention across the entire system. I know our new CEO wants this to be a priority as well, and I look forward to working with her to improve health care recruitment and retention so that we can stabilize our health care system now and for years to come. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Member. Have we, anybody else wishing to speak to the motion? I've exhausted my list, so I'll go to the mover of the motion, uh, Borden Kinkora. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the, uh, the submissions and the comments and remarks from uh, the members who have taken the time to, to speak to, to the motion. Um, the motion presented an opportunity to government to to right a wrong uh, and to take a corrective course of action to 
an initiative that created uh, an inequity uh, and an unfairness in the healthcare workplace. And uh, I appreciate the Minister's uh, remarks, although uh, I'm uh, quite disappointed to hear that the Minister can't support the, the motion and take the uh, opportunity that's been made available to, to correct the, the injustice that he had himself has admitted hearing uh, uh, from, from people um, who have reached out to him. And I'm sure many of us in this chamber have had people reach out to us. I know I certainly have. Um, who have been uh, disappointed um, with that particular initiative that was brought against the advice of uh, people in health PEI, uh, but the government proceeded with it anyway. Uh, if I heard the minister correctly in his uh, remarks, uh, they were attempting to achieve a stabilization payment. If I think I heard the word correctly, a stabilization payment, well, unfortunately, what the payment did was destabilize the health care uh, And uh, unfortunately, it had the exact opposite effect. The intended effect was not achieved, uh, as, as history has shown. So a vote against uh, the motion, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, really boils down to a vote against uh, attempting to achieve uh, parity and equity in the health care environment. Uh, that's what I would uh, submit would be the result of, of, of a vote against uh, this particular motion. Um, I have nothing further, Mr. Speaker. At this point, I would move to close the debate and uh, call for uh, the vote in the form of our recorded division, please. Thank you, Member. Uh, recorded division has been requested. Sergeant Arms, can you ring the bell? Mr. Uh, Speaker, the third party is ready for the vote. Thank you. The opposition is ready for the vote. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, government's ready for the vote. Thank you, members. All those voting against uh, motion 86, please rise. of Environment, Energy and Climate Action, the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure, the member from Charlottetown Winslow, the Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture, the Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population, the Minister of Social Development and Seniors, Minister of Housing, Land and Communities, the Minister of Health and Wellness, the member from Rustico Emerald. Oh, pardon me. The member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. All those voting in favor of the motion, please rise. The member from Borden Kinkora, the leader of the third party, the member from Charlottetown West Royalty, the leader of the opposition, the member from Surrey Elmira, the member from New Haven Rocky Point, the member from Summerside <coughs> Wilmot, the member from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke. 
Thank you, members. Uh, Honourable Member, your motion has not passed. Uh, New Haven, Rocky Point, and the third party house leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I now call motion number 103 be read. Shall I carry? Motion 103. The member for New Haven Rocky Point moves, seconded by the member for Borden Kinkora, the following motion. Whereas effective oversight on the spending of taxpayers' money is a fundamental part of a healthy democracy and of ensuring good government. And whereas a large portion of government spending amounts to tens of millions of dollars expended through procurement of goods and services. And currently there is legislation on PEI guiding spending on the procurement of goods, but none on the procurement of services. And whereas services include major annual government expenditures such as legal services, road building and maintenance, and provisions of health care. And whereas every other Canadian province has legislation in place that applies to procurement of both goods and services. And whereas Treasury Board policies are insufficient to ensure public trust and confidence that government spending is being done with appropriate oversight. And whereas for many years there have been strong calls from the third party, the media and members of the public for stronger controls of government procurement spending. Therefore, be it resolved that this Legislative Assembly urge government to immediately create an internal audit function that would, among its key priorities, provide assurance there is no conflict of interest and that the procurement process is providing value for money. Therefore, be it further resolved that the reports of the internal audit function be made public as soon as they are completed, and therefore be it further resolved that this Legislature urge government to develop and table legislation overseeing the procurement of services by the end of this calendar year. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point to move Thank the motion. You. I wonder if I could have the podium, please, Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Welcome back. Um, I, uh, I'm really glad to rise this afternoon and speak to this motion. Uh, for quite some time now within politics on Prince Edward Island, uh, a couple of very uh, prominent issues have dominated discourse. And it seems sometimes in here that we talk of little else but health and housing and cost of living, all obviously critical concerns. Um, we're, we're in here to express the uh, issues brought forward to us by our constituents. This is the people's house and we are their representatives. So of course it's entirely appropriate that the, this sitting, the by-election that just happened in District 19, and looking back to exactly a year ago when we were all in the midst of a general election here in our province, that healthcare and housing and affordability were the predominant issues that we found ourselves debating and discussing at almost every doorstep. And when I think more recently of the by-election in District 19, uh, where I had the, the pleasure of, of knocking on many hundreds of doors there were very, very few where healthcare was not the top issue which was brought forward. Of course, it coincided with the, um, the sort of bubbling up the, of, of concerns at the Prince County Hospital, uh, which many of the folks in that district are served by. Um, so that, I think, informed the debate. But even before that, the concerns regarding health uh, were very much front of mind for all of the citizens of District 19. But this motion this afternoon um, is a little bit of a departure, and I say a little bit because what we're talking about here is the wise expenditure of tax dollars. And for me, um, when I, I know I, I came here as a Green member to this legislature nine years ago, and there were expectations that I would talk about 
our forests and our beaches and our fields, and many other issues, no doubt. But the, the thing which I look back at the legislation that I have passed through this House and the things that I talk about um, as passionately as anything else, uh, good governance always seems to be at or near the top of my consistent concerns. And I'm concerned because our province does not have uh, a rosy past when it comes to good governance. And I'm talking about times when one of the legacy parties would be voted out and one of the other legacy parties would be voted in. And concurrent with that, hundreds and hundreds of people would lose their jobs within the civil service. Uh, the person, typically a man driving the snowplow, would hand the keys over to somebody else. The school bus drivers would change. And the, the lack of transparency uh, of the way that this province was run, uh, or perhaps the excess of transparency is a better way of putting it, Madam Speaker, in the way that this province was run, was quite clear to everybody. We've come a long way since those days, since the days of uh, a pint of moonshine and various other objects and briberies being provided to folks to encourage them to vote certain ways. We've come a long way since then. And that's something I think we should all be very proud of here. We have a very professional civil service. We no longer have that clean out of one group and, and, uh, and welcoming of another one, which, I mean, apart from the, just the partisan horror of that, the damage to the civil service was tremendous when you lose that institutional knowledge, people who had over, sometimes over many years, decades, built up experience in a particular file, in a particular department, um, turfed out. And somebody with often no experience brought in. Again, thankfully, we're past that now. But we still have work to do. And the motion that is before us this afternoon is an example of that work. We are still catching up with other jurisdictions particularly other provinces here in Canada, when it comes to um, the frameworks of control that are present in our government uh, programs and services. This motion specifically talks about the procurement process. Now, I, I think it's important perhaps to frame the debate around this motion uh, carefully, because procurement is not a word that typically finds its way into conversation. Um, and I always struggle, I always try hard to make sure that the, the issues that we talk about in this house are, um, that they are available for all islanders to to really get their heads around and comprehend what we're talking about. Procurement is buying, it's purchasing. The procurement of, of goods and services, goods, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more later about not really a formal definition of what goods are and what services are, but it's important for the purposes of this motion because it's specifically talking about the, the, pro the procurement, the purchase of services, that we understand the distinction between what a good is that government buys, and there are many of them, and also what a service is. Because here on Prince Edward Island, we do have legislation that governs the purchase of goods. Although, again, almost shockingly, uh, it was just brought in with the previous Liberal government under Wade McLaughlin. Prior to that, we had no legislation regarding the procurement of goods or services. We had Atlantic agreements that we had to comply with in certain areas, but we had no provincial statute regarding the procurement, the purchasing of goods and services. The only province, again, how many times do we say this in this house, the only province without such a provision. 
So I was glad to see that come through the House. And like many pieces of legislation, I, I don't remember the exact dates, Madam Speaker, but I think it was passed around 2017 or 18, um, and then left unproclaimed until 2020 something. I want to say 22. I could be wrong on that. Anyhow, the point is, well, no, I think it was 2020. The, the point is that only very, very recently in the tenure of at least half of the folks sitting in this room today, uh, we introduced our first piece of legislation which set in controls and frameworks around the purchase of government goods. But it did not extend to goods and services. Now, if you look at any other province in Canada and you look for a piece of legislation which governs the procurement of goods and services, you will find a piece of legislation which typically is called the Procurement of Goods and Services Act, sometimes various versions of that. On Prince Edward Island, you don't find that. You find a piece of legislation which is called the Procurement of Goods Act. Services are not mentioned. And I can only think, I mean, back, back in the day when this was passed by Wade McLaughlin and, and the Liberal government of the day, I, I was a kind of a newbie uh, MLA at that point and, and didn't truly understand fully the language of legislation. I still have issues, <laughs> troubles with that. I have no training in that. But I have learned to, as I read through a piece of legislation or listen to debate on a piece of legislation, to focus in on where the critical elements are. And I don't remember, I actually haven't looked, I should have done that part to standing to speak to this motion, but I should have looked back to any remarks that I made during debate on that bill in Committee of the Whole as we, as we typically debate bills here in this House. Um, but presumably there were good questions asked by, at that time, the, the opposition party, the Conservatives, to the McLaughlin government about why services were being omitted from this particular bill. I don't know what that debate was, but I'm sure there were arguments made on both sides. And anyway, the bill that we have now is just for the procurement of goods. And I would argue, and you will hear me say this a number of times during debate on this motion, that that is a shame for islanders. Um, because tens of millions of dollars, islanders' dollars, taxpayers' dollars, public funds, are spent in this province on services without any legislative framework, any controls, any oversight, any monitoring processes um, to accompany that spending. And therefore, islanders cannot have confidence that this government and any government before them, and I want to be fair and clear on that, any government in the history of Prince Edward Island has never had the sort of scrutiny that governments everywhere else in Canada are subjected to, an appropriate scrutiny as to why they are spending public dollars, islanders, taxpayers' dollars, on certain things without any oversight whatsoever. I've always subscribed to the belief that when it comes to taxes, there are two things which offer comfort. Nobody likes paying taxes. I understand that. And some people would like us to ax taxes left, right, and center. I don't think there are many in this room who subscribe to that sort of political uh, attitude. But I think there are people who, despite the fact that they would rather not pay as much tax as they do, are given comfort when they know two things. One, that the taxes that are collected by government, that that collection of taxes is done in an equitable, fair manner. And by that, I don't mean the same for every single person. I believe that fair, equitable taxation is progressive taxation, where those who can most afford to pay the taxes do indeed pay more. And that's why we have income tax brackets. That's why corporate taxes are in place as they are. The carbon tax, if you look at it, and I know that's a, that's a dirty word in some legislatures these days, but the carbon tax is a truly progressive tax. 
because you will find, and the statistics bear this out, time and time again, that those with higher incomes, and therefore those who are more able to pay taxes, have a much higher carbon footprint than low and middle income islanders or Canadians. Pick your, pick your jurisdiction. Wealthy people have large homes. They have second cars. They have yachts, perhaps. They travel freely and often around the world. And the correlation between your carbon footprint and your income is very, very well documented. The carbon rebate, I hadn't planned on talking much about this, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to take this opportunity because I haven't heard the carbon tax debated other than uh, when the member for District 10 I asked the Premier some questions about it last week, and I, I listened with great interest to that conversation. One thing that was missing from the conversation last week and, and from those who would like to axe the tax is the fact that rebates are given. The money is collected dependent on how big your carbon footprint is. The less you use, the less tax you pay. The more you use, the more tax you pay. And then it is rebated on an equitable basis, on an equal basis, I should say, per household. So if you are living in a house which uses very little carbon, you will receive the same rebate as somebody who lives in a 5,000 square foot mansion uh, with a couple of large vehicles and other carbon sucking behaviors. You will pay a lot more in taxes than you will ever receive in a rebate. But for a low income family who perhaps um, don't go on holiday, uh, use public transit, uh, have accessed the, the heat pump program. Thank you, government, for that program. That allowed so many islanders to reduce their carbon footprint to get off fossil fuels and onto cleaner, not clean, but cleaner electricity. And we're working on that. I understand that. But that offered people an opportunity where they perhaps couldn't come up with the capital costs of installing a heat pump in their home, the ability to do that and for every month after that to reduce their carbon footprint and therefore their carbon tax. And they will get a rebate the same as, the same as somebody else will um, in a much higher income bracket. But the rebate to them more than compensates for the tax that they are paying into the carbon tax system. It's actually at its core a very progressive tax and almost a an income redistribution, a wealth distribution, re redistribution tax, although it's not designed that way, but that's essentially the way it works. So again, I went on much longer about that than I had imagined. Consumption tax are the same. Um, people who, who make more money spend more money, and the consumption tax, therefore, is a larger burden for them over, overall. So I mentioned there were two things that make people comfortable regarding taxes and, and let them get over our sort of inevitable allergy to paying taxes. And the first one is that those taxes are collected equitably. And I've just described what I think a, an equitable taxation system is, which is a progressive one. And the second thing is, and this is where this motion is relevant, that those taxes collected by government are thoughtfully and prudently spent. I think if Islanders had confidence that government was spending their money in a way that was giving Islanders the best value for money, then I think a lot of their concerns expressed or implied or just thought within their own heads would be eased. They would be comforted. And this motion looks at that part of the equation, at the spending side of the equation. How can we, as best we can as legislators in this assembly, create a framework that gives all islanders confidence that the money that government spends is being spent in the, the most careful, thoughtful way to get most value for money? And at the moment, without legislation, we cannot stand here and confidently say that. We just can't. And again, that's a shame for Islanders. 
It's a disservice to islanders. Government, of course, spends money on all kinds of things. About a third of the budget, over a billion dollars now, gets spent on health care. And that's one of the reasons it's, it, do, it dominates debate currently. Uh, the largest amount of spending within the health care budget is on salaries. Uh, I don't know the proportion, but it's a, it, it, it's a chunk. Um, of course, there are many other expenditures related to health care, but in the operational budget specifically, um, a large amount of that money gets spent on, uh, on salaries. That's true within the education system as well, uh, another provincial uh, area of jurisdiction, which is, uh, the, I believe, the second highest cost in our, of any department. I'm looking to the finance minister to verify. I'm not sure if it is or not. I think it is. I think education is our second highest provincial expense by department, but I stand to be corrected on that. Um, again, the vast majority of that uh, spent on, on wages. We also spend on lots of other things, on infrastructure, housing, roads, uh, parks, public buildings, uh, libraries. Um, we make grants to businesses, to nonprofit organizations, to municipalities, and on and on and on. Government spends in a huge variety of ways in a large number of areas. And much of that spending, not all of it, but much of that spending falls into the categories of either goods and services. And so I'm going to spend a little bit of time now uh, outlining exactly what that means. Salaries are not services unless you go outside of government and procure services from um, the private sector, and I'll get to that later. But goods, let's talk about goods. Goods is stuff. Goods is... Um, Computers, it's pencils, it's pens, it's buses, it's flood control measures, it's playgrounds, it's, uh, uh, it, it's all, of the, all of the tangible things that you can see and that government buys. Services are, um, services are different. Services are expensive, expenses for acquiring skills and, and expertise that either cannot be provided by government employees themselves or government feels can be done more economically by an individual or an entity outside of government. And they are, services are things like legal advice. They are things like road building and maintenance, accounting services, the delivery of some health care, like, like dental care or pharmacare and some long-term care. We all know that there are, we have a hybrid system here. It was mentioned during question period today where um, a large amount of public funds is expended into the private sector to provide long-term care here. Those are all services that fall in any other province under a piece of legislation called the Procurement of Goods and Services Act. But here, they sit in a legislative black hole. In every other province, the purchase of both goods and services is regulated through specific legislation designed to do that. And on PEI, as I said earlier, our Procurement Act is simply called the Procurement of Goods Act. So why does this matter? Why should islanders care whether we have a Procurement of Goods Act or not? or a Procurement of Goods and Services Act or not. Well, I hope in my remarks today I can make the case why it matters a lot. Anybody who pays taxes, anybody who is concerned about their community, anybody who is concerned about the running of a government that does its best to provide value for money needs to be concerned about this. Without a piece of legislation over the procurement of services, it means that we have no mechanisms in place to guide processes, no parameters in place for how those services are purchased. There are, of course, Treasury Board policies that sort of act in this space. But as we all know, policies are not legislation. And they are so far away from creating the sorts of frameworks that we need to provide 
proper controls and true accountability for the spending of islanders' dollars. So the, here are some of the things that we don't know because we don't have a piece of legislation governing the, the purchase of services. We don't know how much we're spending. My guess is it's at least tens of millions of dollars, perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars that are being spent on services in this province. But we don't know. I don't know. Islanders don't know. The media don't know. Perhaps government doesn't even know. So we don't know how much we're spending. We often don't know who is getting the money. Sometimes you have to dig really deep down during the debate on estimates to figure out where the money is actually ending up. And uh, uh, we've already had to do that on a couple of occasions here, some questions regarding the housing file yesterday. Um, illuminated a few things for me about some programs and where the money has gone, or perhaps more accurately, where the money has not gone. So we don't know how much we're spending. We don't often know who is getting that money once it goes out the door. We don't know who else may have bid for that particular piece of work. Other provinces, by law, have to publish everybody who puts a bid in above a certain level for services and goods. But here we're talking about services. And the citizens of that jurisdiction can look at the various bids that came in and feel confident that government has made an informed choice amongst a bunch of options and that they have chosen the one that presumably will give best value for money for those citizens. Now, that does not always mean that it's the cheapest bid that comes in, and I understand that. And in fact, almost, I, I would say every piece of legislation, I haven't looked at them all, but legislation provides that uh, flexibility that does not mandate, mandate government to always choose the cheapest bid that comes in, because there are many other reasons why you may want to choose a tender that comes forward other than the cheapest one. But the problem is we don't know. We don't know who else made a bid for the work. We don't know whether those bids were comparable, if we were comparing apples and apples. We don't know why government chose the bid that they did. We don't know whether the same companies routinely get, or individuals, routinely get the same government work without any tendering process whatsoever. And that's one of the other things that we know. Some processes are tendered, but not all. And they're certainly not mandated by legislation to be tendered. And that's also a huge problem. So we don't know how much we're spending. We don't know who's getting the money. We don't know who else may have made a bid for the work. And we don't know whether the winning bid represents the best value for money, because we have no way of comparing it to any others that may have come forward. Or it may be the sole source. And as we well know, there are huge problems when governments sole source contracts. And there's all kinds of examples that I could bring forward to uh, illuminate that. Most recently, the ArriveCan app, uh, a federal program, of course, which um, was sole sourced, started out as uh, a contract where the, and I, I don't know the exact figures of this, Madam Speaker, but the, the original tender was that it was going to cost several thousand dollars. I want to say a couple hundred thousand dollars. The cost of that didn't double. It didn't go up by 10 times. It didn't go up by 100 times. It went up by tens of thousands of times. And while we don't have the, f the final figure for that, they're still trying to work that out. We know that it ended up costing millions and millions of dollars, and it didn't work particularly well, but that's another issue. I'm not going to go down there. What I'm trying to um, make clear is that when we don't have good processes, when we don't use competitive bidding processes, we open ourselves up to waste islanders' taxpayers' dollars. 
Another example might be the Phoenix Pay System. Again, uh, a federal program, but my goodness, the issues that, that evolve because that, again, a sole sourced contract initially uh, just went horribly sideways. And the amount of wasted public funds on the Phoenix pay system, uh, which again, I mean, I, I, I get my tummy turns inside out when I even think about it, um, as a result of, n of not following good procurement policies and legislation. And we're talking about the federal government where they actually do have pretty decent legislation in place. Even there, it can happen. Goodness knows what's happening here in Prince Edward Island or has happened here in Prince Edward Island when it comes to the amount of wasted public money that has been spent on services that none of us or very few people know anything about. My last example would be the sponsorship scandal in Quebec. I mean, I'm going back r rather a long way now, but it is the mother of all scandals when it comes to, to the procurement of government services. Um, $5 billion was the, was the figure attached to the, to the sponsorship scandal in Quebec. Um, so we know when things go wrong, governments can waste lots and lots and lots of, of Islanders' dollars. And of course, all of those federal programs would have included a certain amount of Islanders' dollars, and in, in they were federal programs, but we pay federal taxes. But here on Prince Edward, I'm more concerned with the procurement, the purchase of service here on Prince Edward Island. And those scandals, to a certain extent, were only uncovered um, and the, the light shone in those very dark places because they have legislation in place that, that, that governs that. And of course, that's something we don't have here on Prince Edward Island. So it's very difficult to know whether it's ever happened here. I, feel pretty confident in saying that I, I, if I made a bet that th at some point along the line government dollars have been wasted because of pure, uh, poor procurement practices. I'm trying to say that three times. Um, but I don't know. And I, as going back to the reasons why this matters, it's because we don't know how much money we've spent, who it's gone to, whether it was a competitive bid. So the motion calls for a piece of legislation to govern the procurement of services. But it also calls, uh, I don't have a copy of the motion in front of me, I believe there are two operative clauses. One calls for a piece of legislation um, related to the procurement of services. The other calls for internal auditing. Now, as if all that I've just said wasn't bad enough in terms of an absence of controls here on Prince Edward Island legislatively for the spending of public funds on services, we also don't have any internal auditing capacity here or function. Again, as far as I'm aware, and again, I stand to be corrected on this, we're the only province that does not have an internal auditing function. And uh, let, me be, let me be clear what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about the Auditor General's office. The Auditor General's office, a wonderful place. They do stellar work. That's an independent office from government. Um, they perform crucial work and they are truly at arm's length from government. And they produce, of course, the annual auditor's reports and, and, and also individual specific reports on, on particular issues. And that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about internal audit processes within government, within departments of government. Again, I, I I stand to be corrected, but I believe that every other province has, to a certain extent, internal audit functions, where departments themselves have frameworks in place to establish proper processes and to have sort of ongoing monitoring of projects on which they are going forward with to ensure that they are on track, that they are accomplishing their desired outcomes. Hopefully those desired outcomes are clearly stated. And and an ability to intervene if that's not the case. That's what an internal audit does within a department. It, it checks in on a regular basis on a project to make sure that it's accomplishing what it was set out to do, that the money is being spent effectively and efficiently and equitably, 
and that if there are problems, they are identified early on and rectified, corrected as soon as possible. And the role of that internal audit function, which this motion also calls for, is to provide deputy heads and, and the public, islanders, with the assurance that, govern, that governance, that risk management and control processes within departments are operating effectively. Um, Islanders deserve to know that their government is operating with best practices and that when it comes to government spending of their dollars, that Islanders are getting the best value for money that they possibly can. And the effective um, purchase of goods and services is also critical to government in providing programs and services that represent uh, the best value for money, um, where you get the, the best you possibly can for the least cost. Islanders deserve nothing less. And I think there are many areas where governments strive to do that well. And I see strenuous efforts being made in some areas uh, where civil servants are working extraordinarily hard, often in difficult circumstances, um, to eke out those public funds and to make sure that the programs or services that they are in charge of are being run efficiently and effectively. And my goodness, my, my hat goes off to the many civil servants across government who are working very, very hard to make sure that Islanders' taxpayers' dollars are, are being spent wisely and carefully. <coughs> and, Madam Speaker, I dream, I dream one day of uh, debating the budget in this chamber, uh, in Committee of the Whole, where everybody in this room, everybody in this room, uh, is fully informed of the objectives of a particular program or service, um, where X, whatever it was that was budgeted for um, a particular program or service, was put there to achieve certain results. We set out at the very beginning to say we're spending this money to achieve this end. And during debate on the budget, the government will tell the House whether they did or did not achieve those ends and that they've been measuring that. They had a clear goal in sight. They had, they had ways of monitoring and measuring that and that they can come back to the House and say, yes, well, we did or did not meet that. And as a result of that ongoing monitoring, that this year's estimates that are in front of us now uh, will take that into account, the feedback that we got from last year's spending that did or did not achieve those results has been increased or reduced, and they make the case for why we need more money here or perhaps we don't need so much money here in order to better accomplish those stated goals. <coughs> I dream of a budget process that looks like that. We're about to enter into it in, uh, I think, about one minute, uh, Madam Speaker. And that ability to truly hold government to account, not just for the dollars and cents that they spend, but for the goals and the results that they are achieving or not achieving, that's what a proper budget debate process looks like. Madam Speaker, I, I want to uh, adjourn debate, uh, seconded by the leader of the third party. <coughs> government motions, orders of the day government, uh, the Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the first order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? <clears throat> order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. Honourable Member. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take further consideration of the grant of supply of His Majesty. Tell Kerry. Kerry. Honourable Deputies. Speaker, please chair Committee of the Whole.
The House is now a committee of the whole House to consider the grant of supply to His Majesty. Uh, Minister, would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes. Shall it carry? Welcome back. Can you uh, reintroduce yourself and your title for Hansard, Matthew, please? Yes, uh, Matthew Proct, and I'm the Director of Finance for the Department of Housing, Land and Communities. Excellent. Minister, do you have any opening comments or shall we get back into questions? Uh, uh, my only comments are we tabled uh, the take backs earlier um, and um, that's it. We'll get right into Excellent. questions. Uh, so members, we are on page uh, 135, the PI Housing Corporation. We have read all the totals and uh, we're debating it now. And I have Charlottetown West Royalty and New Haven Rocky Point on my list. Uh, if anybody else wants on, just get a hold of me and we'll start with Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to go back to the line about uh, Park Street Development Plan, the $35,800. After today, Minister, that's the that's the Carleen Donnelly contract. Is that the full amount for her contract? She was talked about being brought on by the Premier's office and your office. Is that the full amount that she's getting paid, or is there any, anything else? Uh, yes, for the, for this contract, that would be that would be the full amount. Okay. Sheldon West Royalty. Is it is it? Um, we talked about it before that in the motion we talked about an independent independent consult but you mentioned too that you said it was independent but you also mentioned that she's a special advisor what what is she is is that independent or is that a special advisor to you and the premier um i'm not sure what the distinction is um she's independent from government she's not a government employee it's third party advisor so i, I call that independent yeah shall i wish her because i wouldn't i i wouldn't Necessarily, I haven't seen the scope of the work. I haven't seen the independence of it. I don't know what uh, it's, it didn't sound like it was independent because we've it sounded like she was a special advisor advising you on what to do and not not being able to have free reigns over what she saw. Um, just I, I just don't understand the scope of what what that was. Was it uh, so anyway? I can move on from questions if you if you want. I just wanted to clarify that. So appreciate it, Minister. Um, yeah, you can uh, floor on our thank you very much. Um, so uh, I'm also thank you for bringing the take backs uh, back. I appreciate that. And um, I just want to you did bring stuff on scattered sites, which caused create created further confusion uh, I, I, for, with me anyway, because it says the PEI Housing Corp previously used hotels to support clients and the Salvation Army provided case management for those clients. Um, that's the first. So it's not in their contract. Not the new contract. Or the old Charlotte one. Oh, sorry. Or, oh, sorry. Or, or, or the old one. So you're saying that scattered housing sites were hotel rooms? Yes. Charlotte West Royalty. And it was in the old contract. Oh. I've, I've, I've got it right here. And it's, it's what, what I was told on the floor of this legislature by previous ministers that the scattered housing sites was one house with seven units in it at the time. Um, that was a scattered housing site. Uh, is that it included hotel motel rooms as well? Okay. Charlton, what's your old? So there's a strict reporting on that uh, in the old contract. Um, can you can you bring back information on was that reported on? It, you know, under that service, they had they had specific things to bring back or to, to report to you. Are you confident that you received all the reporting from that? If it was in the contract, I'm confident it was received, yeah. Uh, Sheldon, what's your old So what, what I don't understand is, too, that um, on this other line, the shelter support line hotel bookings, um, $753,000 from year to date to January 31st. That, that's, do we spend $750,000 on hotel rooms? There, there would have been a portion of that that, that was on, on hotel rooms. Charlotte, how much are 
seven hundred thousand dollars in hotel rooms. This is supposed to be. Oh, he said a it, portion of it. Okay, what's the Charles Taylor Road? What members? Uh, so Sorry. I understand that this is a very concerning thing that you're diving into, and and of course that you're comparing a contract from last year to a contract to this year as well, and then we're allowing the debate yep. to happen. But for the record and for answers, we do have to come through the chair yes, for this stuff. So uh, even uh, uh, to the the people at the table too. Rather, let the min uh, let the member finish his comment, even if you if you know the answer kind of thing, and then we can cede the floor to you, and then I'll go back to the member just sure. to bring some. Abs absolutely. Charles, I got it. I got it. Thank you very much. Um, so the, a portion of the seven hundred and fifty-three thousand dollars spent in one month period was for hotels. Is that a one month period? And what what was the portion of the money spent on hotels? Well, that wouldn't have been a one-month period. That would have been from kind of year to date until January 31st. Okay. Cheryl Dan, what's your idea? So that's an enormous amount of money, but how much of that $700,000 that we spent last year on hotels, how many hotel room bookings did we have? Um, I'll just start with that. Thank you. I wouldn't have the specific number of bookings. Um, there would be... Approximately 300, 500. Yeah, that's. I wouldn't have the specific number of bookings, so I could. I could take that back. Sure, that was Rody. Thank you, Chair. That in your documents and in in the in the contracts that I've seen is supposed to be a last resort. Um, how did we, how did we get up to spending that much money, and were all those hotel rooms managed by the contract? by the Salvation Army that I was just referring to that the minister said was, was it last year? I, I Under scattered housing. Are we talking about the old contract, the new contract? Cheryl, that was really. The problem, the problem with that is, well, there's so many different questions. When was it, when did they stop providing services to hotel room clients in Prince Edward Island? It was part of the old contract. It no longer is. So their case management services, um, that funding for scattered site case management rolled into their uh, base funding for um, the new root site after the beds were increased from 9 to 18. Charles, uh, I one more, and then we'll put you back on this. I'm coming back on this for sure, but that that doesn't make any sense. How can you roll over funding when they didn't? They're not providing the service now. Um, you, you've rolled it over with the same amount of beds at the Smith Lodge location. They, Minister, you took Deacon House and and this this government got a Deacon House out of that same facility, and those beds got taken over and managed by by Smith Lodge. So we're essentially, and they went to Park Street. Those beds went to Park Street. The minister knows it. I want to know why are you rolling over funding and who's taking care of the scattered housing sites now if, if that money's being rolled over? Uh, John Howard Society does some case management at, uh, for some of our hotel, motel clients. But case management of scattered sites is not part of the Salvation Army contract. I'll come back to you. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, nice to see you back again, Matthew. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more. I just started asking questions on this yesterday. The Municipal Infrastructure Fund. Um, that was one of the ones where, um, at least up to this point, no, no money has been expended to the end of January of this year. And I know last year the Minister mentioned when this program, because it was a new program then that you, as it became developed and was spun up, that you wouldn't expect to spend a lot of money last year. Uh, but I, I also, um, I'm wondering how much is, uh, you have 10,000 I believe uh, budgeted for this year. Um, for the in oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm not looking up. Actually, I don't see the housing infrastructure 
fund mentioned in that list of grants? Does it, does it fit inside one of the other things? Uh, so that would be, that would be the, um, the 1.25 that's there for the infrastructure program. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. So I see, yeah, I'm, I'm looking in the big book here, and, and that, that is indeed what was forecast for oh. last year. Again, from what I can see, nothing spent this year, but I don't, we don't have a breakout list for grants for this year as we do for last year. And I don't see that, and it was a $25 million fund spread over four years, if I remember right, but, but a lot of money. So I would have expected to see that infrastructure fund somewhere specifically in this year's budget estimate, but I don't. Yeah, so that, that number rolls up into the, the affordable housing development line. Okay, great. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you. And can you tell me again, Matthew, how much that, that is for this year? Uh, that, was, that was the 1.25 that I mentioned. Right. New Haven uh, Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. So that's the same amount that was budgeted last year. Now, I, 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 I do note that it wasn't spent last year, but it was a four-year, $25 million fund. S sounds to me like either it's very back-end loaded in terms of its spending, or we're struggling to get the program established to the point where we can actually expend the money usefully. Is there, do you know which of those it is? There, there, I mean, the, the criteria and the program is still being developed, so it is probably a little more on, on the back end, but, but what we have in there for, for the current years is 1.25. The ball is in the Federation of PEI Municipalities Court. Um, I expect we can um, get that finalized and up and running very shortly. New Haven Rocky <coughs> Point. Yeah, so just so I'm clear on that, Minister, so the, the money which is provided by the province to the municipalities, the hold up here is that the, the municipalities have not come forward with... No, they're just reviewing the, the final terms of the whole agreement and the program. Okay. Yeah. All right. New Haven Rocky Point. And do you anticipate that that full $25 million, which was to be spread over four years, that that will, in the remaining three years, we're looking at $20 million in the last years be spent? This is a program that will be administered by the FPEIM, so if they can get it out the door at that rate, I would like them to spend every penny of that money. Here, here. It'll be up to them to administer it and, uh, and bring their municipalities on board to take advantage of it. Yeah, but uh, uh, that's my hope, is that every penny of it is spent and put to good use to build uh, affordable housing. Sure. Uh, New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you. And I, I 100% agree with you, Minister. I, I hope whatever the holdup is there gets resolved and, and that, that we do end up spending every, as you put it, every penny. Um, the Community Housing Expansion Program, um, there's uh, the program, it was, as I understand it, to create new housing and acquire existing, acquire existing affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll like, where's the breakdown there of the 10 million for acquiring existing affordable and building new? Uh, I don't expect, I, I, I think the intention is, I'm sure the intention is, is to uh, focus entirely on acquisitions the first year. Okay. And it's going to take, I, I think I, uh, I spoke about this bit yesterday. A little bit. Um, there will be fun, the, sort of three streams of funding for this. The first being capacity building with nonprofits, and I think that our intention is to uh, work with some carefully selected nonprofits right off the bat through an RFP process. They're going to have to demonstrate some capacity, uh, track record, and ability to take the, on this project. But we'll invest some money into their capacity in terms of uh, their board of directors and their uh, staff, uh, what have you, so that they can ramp up to take on projects. Um, then there'll be um, some for for. For building, there will be a, a, a pre-construction type funding for engineering plans and um, surveys, um, design, whatever uh, there may be in that case, uh, and then a capital grant component. So in this case, we'd focus first on some capacity building and then provide capital grants to acquire existing affordable housing. Okay. Uh, one more New Haven Rocky Point. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Appreciate that. Um, 
So is it correct then to say that for government, um, the, the idea in this program is that government will own and operate the units that are, no, it's all... Non-profit. Non-profit. This all is community all. housing. So that umbrella of community housing generally involves non-profits uh, and um, housing cooperatives is a, a broad definition of community housing. But what we're doing is building that capacity within the community housing sector to own and operate a much, much larger um, uh, inventory of affordable properties. They, the sector, the community housing sector, really hasn't done much over the last 40 years here. There's uh, a couple of uh, nonprofits that have picked in away at, a, at some projects, but not nearly at, at the pace that private sector is moving. So we want to support them and, um, and build up that whole community housing sector. Great. Thank you, Minister. Can you put me back on the list, please? Sure, sure. Thank you. Uh, Cheryl Tanner with Cheryl. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, just, just to go back to the shelter support line hotel bookings, is that, I, I was always, I always wondered where we paid for our hotel rooms. Was, was it always on that line or is that a new line? Um, in in that grant line, yeah. I, I don't have the, the previous iteration of this, but it's, it's where we have it in this <laughs> this version. Cheryl, mm -hmm. sure, what's your And we talked about I just talked about scattered housing. It was managed by um, uh, Salvation Army. Now it's not, but it's managed by you mentioned it, man, it was managed by John Howard. But I I I don't. I don't know. Is John Howard managing all those hotel bookings? Do they manage with one case manager? Not the bookings. No, no, they don't do the bookings, but they do do some case management. Sheldon, sure, what's your OT? Does, I guess with John Howard, I always see them as a, as a group that gets federal funding um, to, to deliver programs, not, and, and to provide support around. But now I'm seeing a grant going to John Howard Society for case management. I, I don't. I don't know if that's a, a grant to John Howard. I just said that they are doing some case management that may be through their federal funding. Sure, thank you, Sheryl. In here, John Howard Society, case worker services, uh, and you have ninety thousand dollars budgeted. Yeah, so the, there would be there would be um, a forecast for a, a case worker in there for for them. Sure, thank you, Sheryl. I just, I, I don't, I don't understand why we're, I just want to know what the, can you bring me back to more of the definition of what that case manager does and who they're case managing for? I'm just worried about people not being case managed in a time of need in different parts of Prince Edward Island. So, uh, if I'm correct, I believe the John Howard case management happens only at our supportive housing, our new supportive housing uh, that we purchased in June of 2023 here in Charlottetown. I think that's the extent of it. Charlottetown, was Charlotte? Okay, because we, we just talked about that and you said that they manage the hotels. Or... I, I know that they do case management for us. Um, and I, I know that they are doing case management for our supportive housing and potentially for some of the uh, uh, people that we put in hotel rooms. Charles, okay. what's your OT? And then that, from that scattered housing site, what you wrote me back was, with the additional units added across the system, there was no longer a need for case management at scattered sites. Um, this would include increased capacity to new routes, and we talked, I just talked about that, and the eight new housing with supports in Charlottetown with case managers provided by John Howard as example. But it seems a little bit vague. Are we losing people? Do we have enough in this budget to make sure that everybody in a time of need gets consistent case management across our province. Yeah, and um, you know, for some of our short-term short hotel stays that would be provided through contact the shelter support line, they probably aren't receiving case management, some of the short, but the longer-term uh, stays that are less and less frequent now that we're building a little more capacity in supportive housing, um, there was some case case management that would occur there. Sheldon, what's your OT? And I appreciate the minister taking, um, it's, it's that it, we, we hear when you're invested in this, you hear and you, 
you try to make the system better, and I guess I'm just trying to use this opportunity to control my emotions and make sure that we're on the right track, um, because this is this is very important to a lot of people, and we've heard that it hasn't been necessarily managed with consistency. A lot of people are working very hard, but the, the consistency in case management has has been a gap, more or less, across the board, not because of effort, just because of where we are. Are we bringing this in, and do we have enough people in your in your budget line to make sure we're doing that? Um, I see there's uh, manager emergency shelters, uh, one, emergency shelters case managers, five. I imagine those are the workers at Park Street. But are we doing enough on the outside of those two positions to to make sure we're we're managing and helping people in the time of need from a from a government level. Well, any of our supportive housing will include uh, supports, which uh, includes case management. So we're not going to stand up supportive housing facilities without uh, the proper wraparound services, and um, we are going to continue to add, uh, and accelerate the addition of our supportive housing inventory. Uh, Shroud, one more. Okay, um, I, I want to just, for, for this last question, I want to talk about the importance of carpenters, plumbers, and electricians, and then just say what a great job they do. I know they've, uh, under here, there's 15 FTEs. Um, are we, Minister, do you feel like, and I'm talking to them when they're in doing different things, uh, they're, they're in very much high demand. We need them to, to maintain our housing stock and units. Are the, those positions start at, at 51,000 and their U11s? Um, are, are we, are, are, is that classification where it needs to be in to, to, to make sure we're getting the right people and necessary for those jobs? If it's not, they, they should, uh, you know, the, the classification should be continually uh, reviewed to make sure that we're competitive with the market. And, uh, you know, it, I know that we've done that in cases where it's been difficult to recruit for certain trades, um, so yeah, I think that's generally the way things work. Is there any player of the opposition? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just a question on the tape acts. Yesterday, I had asked a question regarding the line item with the home heating uh, uh, assistance program, and you brought back um, basically uh, your response was every effort will be made to find savings from within existing budget. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, obviously we have um, a number of different items that we have within our, our grant section that, that come out of the Housing Corp. And, um, you know, based, based on that, that increased uptake that we did have in the prior year, we, we kind of continue to evaluate our programs on an ongoing basis. So um, if, if we do have, um, you know, a, a little bit of some delays maybe in some spends in, in certain uh, areas, we would essentially use some of that funding to to be able to fund and, and reallocate to you know one of our programs that has has a strong uptake and, and has a strong um, you know need in the community sure leader of the opposition thank you so you're telling me that you basically it was within your budget and that money that was unused in other programming was used for this 1.6 million there, there may have been a bit of reallocation. If, if we look at the, um, the kind of the, the grants overall, they're they're down a little bit. So, um, you know, the any of the items that may have been um, moved a little bit would be, you know, relating to um, you know, timing, timing of, of programs that were going out, and and as we've kind of evaluated through the year, um, if if there was a, a line that that had a bigger uptake, we would have would have evaluated that and, and allocated some funds there. Okay. Leader sure. of the opposition. Thank you. So with that said, that was $1.6 million in the home heating program itself. But if we look on the light items again, let's say we go with uh, the home renovation program and the, um, um, where am I at here? The home heating program, the home renovation program, and the shelter supports total of all of those are $5 million. So where did that $5 million come from? Reallocation of within that budget or? Yeah, there, there would have been reallocation within 
kind of our grants. Like I think we've we've noticed a few of the um, the affordable housing programs. You know, there's there's a few um, a, a few lower forecasts in there than than we had original budget for, and and we had talked a bit about that and some of the delays in in those programs, either either launching or. Um, you know, when, when we were dealing with, say, construction, there's, there's been some challenges in, in getting some of those programs uh, moving to their full capacity. So there, there would have been some funds to, to move um, there. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. So I guess I'm just going to ask. So there was no money from outside uh, the PEI Housing Corporation that was put into these programs for the overruns? Is that correct? Yeah, we, we would have looked at, at reallocations within within that grant line. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much. Yeah. So another uh, one of my questions yesterday uh, was the Municipal Administrative Support Program. Um, and I asked about certain communities. And so it gives me a little bit of a breakdown in, on here uh, that it was a one-year only program. Is that correct? It's only one year? Yeah. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. So what... Um, in here, it said it was designed to provide financial support up to $15,000 to assist small rural uh, municipalities to, co to comply with the legislative requirements outlined in the uh, MGA. Um, and the funds could be used towards audit expenses, liability insurance, CAO wages, and office expenses, and election expenses. So I guess what I'm trying to get at was last year was not a municipal election year. So what happens? This, like, the subsequent years afterwards, about funding to keep these municipalities afloat, who require assistance if they didn't have it before. Like, what's happening to them moving forward? Yeah, and a lot of our smaller municipalities struggle to um, to keep up uh, with their administrative requirements, and uh, that program operated in that one single year. And I think I did uh, mention yesterday that we have um, we've been looking at uh, a shared services model, which would be sort of like a pool of professional services that could um, um, service multiple municipalities, basically. So I'll go with one more, Leader of the Opposition. Sure. So those uh, shared services would be office space and, uh, and, and staffing? Okay. Would that be correct? Sorry, I missed it. Sorry. So, so would, uh, some, the opposition. would some of those shared services be office space and staffing to meet the, the MGA requirements? Um, I'm not sure about office. Well, yeah, I, I, I guess. Uh, I mean, I believe these would be on, a, on an application basis, so they would yeah. put something forward and okay. we would evaluate what. Okay. Okay, Chair, can you put me back on, please? Uh, I can, for sure. New Haven, Rocky Point. Thank you, Chair. I just have one final question on the Community Housing Expansion Program. <clears throat> and I, I appreciate what your, your comments, uh, Minister, about the fact that this, the nonprofit sector has not Grown either by, uh, have not been able to, to create the housing over the, for, for some time now. And I'm wondering whether that um, disappearance of affordable housing, whether there's a particular community on the island that you're concerned that it's it's disappearing faster than anywhere else? Um, well, uh, you know, I, I, I think that um, affordability is, is, <coughs> is a problem across the board in the province. Um, obviously, um, a lot of our new rental stock that's coming on board is coming on at a much higher rate than uh, typical rents here. Um, I think that accounts for the bulk of our rental increase um, yeah. because we very much throttle the, um, the allowable increases. So uh, I think it's a problem across the board and it's going to take um, lots of effort to address that and try to hold down um, rents uh, for those who I always say are don't make enough to uh, afford comfortably afford market rates and make um, too much to qualify for public housing. New Haven Rocky Point. Yeah, I mean it. It is just a real conundrum where you have really essentially two markets. You have 
existing rental units, which, as you put it, are throttled in terms of their ability to increase rates, and new, new builds which come on at the market rate, which is considerably higher. Have you looked at any, and this is a general question, have you looked at any policies or other jurisdictions, because we, we can't be the only place with that sort of scenario in place, to try and deal in, you know, over, over time with reconciling that? There's all kinds of competing theories about what the best regime is uh, in terms of um, uh, regulation or, or not. Um, there's plenty of evidence out there that um, uh, a regulated market, you know, uh, can suffer on the supply side. Um, uh, but no, we haven't really contemplated any any significant changes to um, regulations. I'm not sure if that was your, your question, yeah. but certainly uh, aware that uh, there's a real balance there uh, in terms of. And you've probably heard me say this: creating the environment uh, healthy, uh, creating the environment that, that makes sense to invest in housing in this province. Yeah. That's a delicate balance. New Haven and Rocky Point. I Thank love you. the debate. I would love if it was more geared towards <laughs> sure, the budget, but it yeah, is a good, no, a good debate. I, I, and that's fair. I, I just, I mean, it's an, it's an issue that's brought up continuously, and yeah. I, I, I don't know what the answer or answers are to that. It's a complex problem. So, I, But I appreciate your candor, Minister. Uh, I'm going to move on to family housing boards, uh, Chair. And I'm wondering if you could just tell us what the, what the role of family housing boards is. Family housing boards manage the family housing in, in different areas of the province. I can't remember. How many boards are there? Eight? Is it eight? Nine. Nine? Mm. Yeah, so they're in charge of uh, selecting the, uh, the residents, uh, maintenance, repairs. New Haven Rocky Point. Okay, great. And uh, I, I see the amount of money here. It's, it hasn't changed. I don't know. I don't have previous years, but is that sufficient for, for them to do their jobs properly? <clears throat> um, yeah, we have, you know, those, those numbers are fairly, fairly static, I believe. New Haven Rocky Point. So, thanks, Chair. Uh, with the potential, at least, of increasing public housing stock, I'm assuming that the role of those family boards might expand also. Is that fair? May expand. Um, we may review the entire um, model and the role they play in okay. the system. Okay. Uh, one I more. Think that, that would, um, I think that would be uh, appropriate as we're also looking at, as we discussed yesterday, the whole role of the housing corporation and how it's structured. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. One more, New Haven Rocky Point. Sure. Thanks, Chair. Uh, moving on to the home heating program, and I know we've talked a little bit about this in previous days, so forgive me if I'm covering similar ground, but there was a story in CBC very recently that there was a uh, a record number of uh, applications in the first 10 days of 2024. It was half a million, I think it was. And I'm looking at the program like it's clearly it's seeing record demand, but I don't see any increase in that budget line. Is there a reason for that? And again, apologies if that question or a version of it has been asked. Yeah, and I, I believe we talked about that yesterday where, um, you know, we have uh, a contract that is ending in, in March and we're kind of, we're evaluating what that looks like going forward. Um, so we've we've got that amount established at what was what was in the existing um, estimate, but we would continue to evaluate what the what the need is for for that program going forward. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Can you put me back on? I can. Uh, Charlottetown West Royalty. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, the um, Smith Smith Lodge, the the under that um, there, there is, is that in here. Is that transitional housing or supportive housing, Minister? Just says Smith Lodge. In the grants handout? Yes. Okay. Smith Lodge. I'm not seeing that line. Okay, in kind of in the shelter supports? Yes. Okay, so Smith Lodge would be. Transitional housing. Shelter, Charlotte. 
and transitional housing is it's 365 days minus one. Um, is that currently happening right now? Are we transitioning people into housing? And how many people have we transitioned into housing last year? I don't know the exact numbers. I had a meeting with housing staff the other day and talked about this and the process for evaluating people to move out of emergency shelters and into transitional and then into housing in the community. It is in fact happening and uh, they work hard to identify the people who are ready to, to move up through the continuum. Uh, they do a lot of work to evaluate people's circumstances, what their motivations are for, for, for seeking to get to move on to the next step. Of course, everyone would like to get into more stable housing. Not everyone has motivations that result in success. So, you know, they put a lot of work into identifying the people that uh, uh, are ready to succeed and move, to move up. And uh, so that was encouraging for me and that, uh, and that there actually is, you know, people moving through the system as it's designed to work, but um, we need to create more capacity, more support yeah. to move people along. Yeah, and I, I, I would completely agree, agree but there's, peop there's people that are, are, are staying, and it's not, if people stay in an 18-unit facility that's full, we can't, we can't get people in and out. So there, there's, that, that's, what the, that's what the problem is, is people are staying maybe longer, they need the supports, but we don't necessarily have the next, the supportive housing. And I'm glad, I'm optimistic that the, that the minister talked about that new place um, that, that they bought. You have purchased different different um, units in this budget. Are you looking upstream into that supportive housing area, and do you have anything for this year that's going to in this budget that's going to allow some relief on the transitional housing program? Well, not this budget, but in our capital budget, like uh, I believe the uh, tender was awarded recently for the. 13 new beds beside new roots. I got to start calling it that. New oh, roots. sorry. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, trying to get away from Smith Law. Smith it's, Law. it's in the budget I book. Know. Yeah, so that really, <laughs> it's here. But, um, and the tender, but we know how ca that was already been delayed once. I uh, already, it's maybe once or twice. So it's a five year capital. So I'd love to see that project get. I will, I'll sit there and compliment you when that gets done and, and gets going. Tender is so, awarded. Okay, perfect. And I'm glad you're answering these questions because it is, I started off this between, it's, I didn't mean to get into capital questions, I meant to get into who's going to support, who's going to support these new facilities. And that's why I kind of asked the, the, the scattered uh, housing questions at the beginning. Um, the, the community outreach center, uh, it's, it's $2.39 million in here, just signed a $5.1 million contract. You only, they're, they're, you're moving soon on a one-year variance, I do believe. Uh, what happens at the end of the year? Sorry, which facility? Uh, sure, the, sure. the community outreach center, which is moving, mm -hmm. um, uh, well, fairly soon. I'll ask that question next. But, yeah. um, you know, what, what happens at the end of the year? If this is a two-year contract, what happens at the end of the year and what, what's the plan for that um, after the, the one-year variance is up? This, again, is part of Carlene Donnelly's work about what happens with um, outreach services. Um, and I think broadly, talked about this before, is that uh, we need to build capacity with our partners in the community to, uh, so that there's alternatives decentralized throughout not just the city but the province and pathways um, you know through outreach <coughs> services pathways for for people to get the uh, services they need when they need it so uh, I can't say specifically but um, we've only got a, a variance for the one year on the on that site down there and um, you know we'll, we're gonna we are engaging with the city uh, about uh, our move there and um, how we manage that over the next year, and but I'll await some of the recommendations from uh, Ms. Donnelly before we make a decision on exactly how that looks at the end of the year. Sure, I'll have a short.
Um, yeah, thanks for that answer, and, and it's um, as best I know as, as the minister could probably do uh, on, on the floor here today. In the new contract, I, I've asked this before, um, health care services are very important um, when people are, are living rough and, and getting those uh, uh, supports they, they, they need. Um, but I ask you this, Minister, why was primary health taking, taken out of the contract? Primary health was in the last contract, and primary health has been taken out. Why? I, I think we're going to deal with that through uh, Department of Health, but I can assure you there will be some services um, provided in that regard. Sure, I'll with Charlotte. But the contract's being dealt with on this budget line with $2.39 million. It's, it's the but as you said, it's, it's not in the contract anymore. Oh. The health Charles. services, primary health services. I guess I was just Charles asking why it was taken out. So you're, you're, I'll ask health on the floor, um, so he'll have some some good answers for you there. Okay, perfect, excellent. Um, One more, Charles Sure. The, sure. The, um, the tiny home development. I'm glad we talked about it, and I was listening closely. Um, they've done a great job of building the tiny homes. Uh, they, they're up in. They, they had a great conversation with with them. They're incredible. They're they're uh, net zero homes. They can. They're, they're state of the art. They're ready to go. The problem is, is that they don't have a place to put them, <laughs> and that that's kind of a roadblock. Can you talk to that? Are you aware of that problem, Minister? Are, are, does the province have land ready to go? And when should we start to see these tiny homes roll out and, and get in so people can live in them? We do have land identified. Okay. Uh, we'll require some infrastructure to be put in. Um, I think we're still trying to finalize exactly what the model looks like for a tiny home community. And I know there are, uh, you know, as just recently as yesterday, there's also uh, private citizens trying to stand up tiny home uh, communities. Uh, you know, they've got a vision for it anyway. Um, everyone, you know, references the uh, community in Fredericton as sort of the model they'd like to replicate. But I'm not sure if what we're doing will, will exactly be uh, mirror that model. But yes, we have land identified, um, and um, it will require some servicing uh, yeah, in order to stand it up. Yeah. And that out too. Uh, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm going to go back to the Municipal Administrative Support Program. So there was 13 municipalities that were invited uh, by Municipal Affairs to participate in the support program. So was it, were there only 13 municipalities that met the eligibility requirements, or were there more? Um, I, forget, what, I think it was only nine that took part, wasn't it? I don't have the... Uh, 13 invitations were sent out, nine. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, 13 met the eligibility there, um, uh, the eligibility criteria. Leader of the Opposition. So why did the other three, or other, sorry, four, not participate? Um... I don't know the reasons. They were invited to. Um, as far as I remember, um, they just chose not to. Leader of the opposition. Thank you, Chair, because I just find it interesting. I know of, of municipalities that I'm looking here by the what, what was based on the criteria for eligibility of other municipalities that would meet, that, that well, I believe would meet anyway, the requirements that are not on this list. And that's why I was asking why the other four didn't uh, Mean it, but you're so you're just saying that only 13 municipalities across Prince Edward Island met the criteria that was uh, put forward, and all of them that met the criteria, which was the number 13, were sent an invitation to participate in the program for one year. Is that correct? 13 invited, nine actually participated. Yep. Okay, I'm going to move to something else here. So, regarding um, family housing. Uh, the units. How um, how are those family housing units heated? Now they're owned by the housing corporation, and I understand families that are in it pay 25% rent, uh, but the heating and electricity are also something that they they have to pay. So I'm just asking, wondering how much or how are those family housing units? And they could be from a bachelor to a four bedroom. How are they heated? 
What source? Uh, there, would, there would likely be a mix of different yeah. sources depending on the buildings. Yeah, it is a mix. Some of them electric, some of them oil. Leader of the opposition. Thanks, sir. So would some of them have heat pumps? I I can't say for sure. Um, but again, there would be there would be a mix of different different heating for those buildings. Leader of the opposition. Thanks, sir. And the reason why I'm asking that is I do again. Um, have individuals or families reaching out to me saying they're finding it very difficult to heat um, their unit, that's to say it's a, a duplex and it's a three bedroom, to heat it with oil, um, especially when oil was really kind of at, at, a, at, a, at a high. Um, so they found it very, very difficult to heat that and it goes back to that story I, I said and when the budget was uh, tabled about, uh, you know, a, a single parent watching that gauge in the oil tank wondering, you know, when is it going to run out? When is it going to run out? So I, I want to know if, if you're, I guess I want to know how many have heat pumps and because the government is trying to move that way, how many have heat pumps and is there any assistance available or any thought available of changing over all of those units that are net presently uh, heated with a uh, furnace, uh, oil, let's say, um, to heat pumps? There are s some with heat pumps. There's a mix of all kinds of heating on family housing units. I believe there are some with heat pumps. We've had some discussion with the, the Minister of Environment Energy um, about housing corporations' properties and converting them to heat pumps. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think there's some question about the corporation's properties being eligible for them, like others or something. Uh, I'm not sure what's being worked out, but the intention is to, to move uh, in that direction for sure. Leader of the Opposition. So are you saying that the PI Housing Corporation is trying to participate in the free heat pump program? We're, we're, we're looking at ways to get uh, uh, heat yes. pumps on all of our units, yeah. <laughs> Leader of the opposition. Okay, so, I, and, I, and I am serious about this, so I really, really believe myself too, and knowing these individuals, and knowing the cost uh, of oil, and knowing how big some of these units are, and knowing so how old some of these units are, and they're not energy efficient, that I really do suggest that, that, that your department uh, move forward with trying to get install as many heat pumps as possible into these units because it's really going to make a difference in, in so many different ways. So that's something I would, yeah. I would, I would ask. I agree with you. Uh -huh. yeah, it's um, yeah. it's the right way to go. Okay, I'll get back on the list, Chair. Sounds good. Uh, New Haven Rockets Point. Thank you, Chair. I'm just going to go back to the tiny home discussion you were having a second ago with Charlottetown West Royalty uh, because I have been approached by at least one uh, person in my district who would be willing or is interested in using their land, and I'm, I'm not sure who you were referring to when you mentioned that private individuals have approached you. Is there any funding set aside to assist people who are willing to house the tiny homes, if I can put it that way? I don't know if we've got anything specifically set aside. <coughs> um, I'm sure we can find um, program of some sort to assist if, uh, if we see the right proposal. New Haven Rocky Point. Thanks, Chair, because clearly there are costs involved in, in establishing the infrastructure around the tiny homes, however many there are. Um, and if I remember right, it's been a while since I read the email, but the, the owner of this land was willing to shoulder that cost themselves. Um, should I tell them to approach the department again, or like what, 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 what would be the best way forward for them? So th this person was willing to shoulder the costs of what, sorry? Of establishing the infrastructure, infrastructure. to support yeah, the tiny Yeah, I mean, uh, we'd certainly, we may have spoken to this person already. I'm Possible. not sure. I don't think they were in your district, though. Okay. Uh, but one of the challenges, if it's in a, <clears throat> uh, a rural area without services, is you know, if you're establishing a tiny home community, obviously it's multiple dwellings and um, there's considerations about uh, septic fields and um, so 
whether you can establish central sewer. Right. It's, it, it can be expensive. So, um, yeah, we'd certainly um, like to hear from anybody who's hey. trying to establish housing of any kind. I hear from them every day. Great. <laughs> you have a rocky point. Thank you. I will certainly circle back with them and, and see where that sits. Uh, if I remember right, the tiny homes, funding for the tiny homes was uh, specifically for rural areas. Is that still a restriction that applies to any grants associated with it? That applies to what, sorry? The, the Rocky Point. Yeah, sorry, Chair, That's my no apologies. That the, there was a restriction regarding access to the funding associated with tiny homes, that it be in rural areas. Is that still the case? Or if I, am I wrong about that? Doesn't ring a bell. I think you might be conflating two different issues. Entirely possible. Yeah. Sorry, Chair, I did it again. New Haven Rocky Point. That's all right. Thank you. Uh, so let's go back to the heating program. Uh, again, the, the, uh, again, my apologies if this question was asked the other day. I don't think it was. But um, are the eligibility requirements for the heating program changing this year, or is it still 45 for individuals and 60,000 for families? Um, I don't believe we have that amount changing right now. It's still the, the, the thresholds that are currently in yeah. place. They haven't changed, and the program's under evaluation. Okay. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you. And do you know how many clients? I see in, in the budget book here that it was actually underspent in the, in the big budget book uh, by a million dollars. Now, that's only up until the end of January. 31st. So is, is the, are you anticipating to spend the other 1.6 million in the remainder of the fiscal year? Uh, for the home heating program, yes. New Haven Rocky Point. And do you know how many clients that represents that we help with that funding in 23-24? Um, it represented... <clears throat> The forecast itself, I mean, if, if everyone received $1,200, the forecast would, would represent about 5,200, 5,300 okay. people or applicants. Do you have Rocky Point? Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Matthew. And, and do you know, do you have a figure as to whether that's in the, uh, because I presume not everybody would have received the maximum amount. Uh, yeah, I don't have the figures on, on the specific amount for each, but. Okay. Right. New Haven Rocky Point. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on to the home renovation program. And last year, we exceeded that budgeted amount, but the, I see that the budget for this year hasn't increased, and I'm wondering why not. Um, again, this would be one of the programs that 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 we would be evaluating. Um, yes, there was there was a bit of a higher uptake um, in the current year, um, but at the moment we've established a budget for um, that was the same as the prior years we would work to kind of remain within that budget but obviously there are you know depending on depending on the applications that come through we would address that as as it comes forward right. okay, Rocky okay. Point, one more yeah okay so I mean that's one of those examples where you establish a program and I, and I understand and this is not easy stuff but if there are more applications than then the money that's set aside is there, and that seems to be representative of the demand from year to year, then one would increase that. So I'm wondering whether there are any plans. You just said that you were reviewing the program. Glad to hear that. But um, are there? Are, are you planning to increase the, the threshold for that? Like the two things, the, the dollar amount um, set aside for it, but also the th income thresholds as you know, people's incomes are worth less and less. Yeah, I, I can't speak to the to the threshold evaluation at the moment. I, I haven't been involved in those conversations. But um, as as far as the budget is concerned at the moment, you know, if if again as as we get into those programs, we continually evaluate what the uptake is and and kind of address the needs as as needed. The uptake's been very good. Yeah, these programs. Yeah. That's great. Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Mr. Last fall, you had said that your department or government had purchased a number of houses, <laughs> houses um, to add to the inventory. Um, how many houses were 
at us? Uh, I mean, that would be capital. Yeah. Yeah, those were all purchased under a capital budget. Uh, well, your department, you're, you're managing them, correct? Yeah, these are all managed under the PEI Housing Corporation. Um, Leave the opposition, perhaps the minister. 104. Oh, he's got it there. So there was that, a, that was a point in time. I think it's there may have been some more purchases since that number. I'm not sure if that's a current number. So let's say there was 104. Leave the opposition. Thank you. Let's say there was 104. Where would those primarily yeah. be located? In the Charlottetown area, or are there any out of sight outside of the Charlottetown area? Um, all over the province. All over the province. Leader of the opposition. Okay, so what criteria was used to select um, these properties to purchase? Uh, need on the uh, our, our housing registry. So we have breakdown by uh, area. Leader of the opposition. Thanks, Chair. So how much public money would have been spent on the purchase of these 100, approximately 104 well, I mean, again, that would be that would be a capital. So item. yeah, and they weren't all in one year. It was capital budget. Leader of the opposition. Okay, I'm just asking these questions because it is managed by the the corporation, and there is a need for housing, obviously, in it, right? So with the acquisition of new hou houses, um, and it was 104, and that's a, that's a pretty big number of housing that was going to help um, some individuals. So all of those houses that you acquired are they presently all being um, used? Are they all, or is there any vacant? I'm not aware of any vacancies. Leader of the opposition. So what's the criteria to be eligible to be in these housing units? The same as all of our other social housing units. Your, uh, um, if it's seniors housing, mm -hmm. it's age and income and housing. Leader of the opposition. Okay. Can, is it possible to get a, a, a list of where these properties, um, are located across Prince Edward Island so that we could have a better understanding of, like you said, it was all over the island. So I would like to know if there's any in my area, just for more than curiosity, but just when people come in looking for housing. Are there Ju just privacy concerns, Minister? Um, I don't know. Uh, that is, I mean, if, it, if it's general locations like uh, towns or municipalities, then it, I suppose it's not a privacy concern, but uh, I'm also wondering, are we talking about just units that were purchased or every dwelling that uh, the housing corporation operates? All the hour. Okay. The hour has been called. We'll, we'll report progress, Senator members. No way. Mr. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shaw Carey. See you next time. Hey, come back one more day. <laughs> I'm sure he really does. <laughs> Just me and you want that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration the grant of supply to His Majesty, I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall carry. The hour has been called. The member from Kensington Mulpeck. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I move, second by Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, that this House adjourn until tomorrow, Thursday at 1 p.m. Shall carry. Carry. Have, have a good evening.